Java is one of the most popular programming languages used to create web applications and platforms. According to the Java homepage, more than 3 billion computers and 4 billion mobile phones worldwide run Java. So keeping the importance of Java in mind, we have come up with this full course. Now, before we go ahead with the session, I'd like to inform you guys that we have launched a completely free platform called Great Learning Academy, where you have access to free courses such as AI, cloud and digital marketing. You can check out the details in the description below. Now let's have a quick glance at the agenda. So we'll start off by understanding what exactly is Java and then we'll install Java and the most popular IDE for Java, which is Eclipse. Then we'll understand what are variables and data types in Java. After that, we'll understand what are operators and work with various operators in Java. Going ahead, we'll work with flow control statements in Java, following which we'll understand the different concepts of object oriented programming. Then we'll understand what is inheritance and implement the concept of inheritance in Java. After that, we'll go ahead to collections and work with two important collection frameworks, which are ArrayList and Lengthlist. So let's start off with the session. Let's start off by understanding what exactly is Java. So Java is a free and open source software. It's just plug and play. All you have to do is install Java once and you can start working with it. Java is also a cross-platform compatible language. So you can run Java on any operating system. Whether you have a Windows, Mac or a Linux system, you can seamlessly run the same project on whatever operating system you have. And Java is also an object oriented programming language. It's actually a pure object oriented programming language. So what do I mean by that? Well, to understand that, let's actually understand what are objects. Now look around you. What do you see? You see a lot of objects, don't you? So let's say there's a bottle in front of you. What is that bottle? It's an object. Now let's say there's a cricket bat in front of you. What again is that? That is an object. Now, if you want to represent all of these objects in a programming point of view, that is when you need an object oriented programming language. So it helps you to represent all of the objects which are surrounded by you in a programming language. Right. So now that we know what exactly is Java, let's go ahead and install Java into our systems. So you can install Java from this site over here. So Java actually belongs to Oracle. So you'd have to go to oracle.com, Java technologies, Java downloads.html. So you'd have to download something known as a JDK. So let's go ahead and download JDK first. So I'll just type in download JDK. I'll click on the first link over here. Now I'll click on JDK download. So JDK stands for Java development kit which as the name states is a kit for you to program all of the Java concepts. And it also gives you something known as Java runtime environment, which helps you to execute your code. So it's basically a kit which helps you to create your programs and also execute your programs. So over here you have uh, different versions of it. So if you have a Linux system, then you can download JDK for Linux. If you have a Mac, then you can download JDK for a Mac. Similarly, if you have a Windows system, then you can download JDK for a Windows system over here. So all you have to do is click on this download button, check this and then click on download. So this is the latest version of Java JDK 14.0.1. And as you see, the download is starting over here. Now I'll just click on cancel because I don't have a lot of Wi-Fi left. So, and I already have JDK in my system. So we've successfully installed JDK into our systems. Now it will actually give you a tool wizard and you have to click on next and that will successfully set up everything in your system. Once you download JDK, you'd have to install a development environment as well. So this is known as integrated development environment. So one such integrated development for Java is Eclipse. And you can download Eclipse from this particular site, eclipse.org slash downloads. So let me click on this link over here. Let's just wait till the link opens up. So what Eclipse does is it provides you a proper platform, a proper development environment so that you can code in a very easy way. Now let me go to the bottom of this. So actually we have this download 64 bit version. And since I have a 64 bit version, I have clicked on that. And when you click on the download button again, the download would start. So as you see over here, the download is starting. Now, since I already have Eclipse in my system, I'll just go ahead and uh, cancel this. 
right so i have successfully installed java and eclipse into my system now let's see how does eclipse look like so let me just open up eclipse and show it to you guys so this is how eclipse workspace looks like now our first task would be to create a new java project so for that purpose i'll click on file and over here we've got a new option and we have to create a new java project so i'll just click on this now you'd have to give a project name so i'll name this as est underscore project now normally when you give a name of a project you keep the first letter to be small over here i'll click on finish so let's just wait for this to be done right so the module name is also create so we have successfully created our first java project now inside this you have the source folder so this is where all of your code would exist now you'd have to right click on the source folder then you have this new option again and inside the source folder you'd have to create a package so click on package and then you'd have to give a name to this package so i am naming this as test project again let me click on finish so we have created this project now again i'll click on this new project over here and inside this i'll have to create a class so over here i'll give a name to this class and i will name this as test project right and over here just click on this which will give you public static void main so this seems confusing to you right now just wait for a few minutes and then you'll properly understand what exactly is going on right so i'll click on finish and this will give you your new class so over here as you see we've got public class test project so this is the name of the class and as i've already told you java is a pure object oriented programming language so whatever you do with java happens inside a class so what exactly is a class you can consider a class to be the blueprint of an object now let's say i already told you what exactly is an object so everything that you see around you is an object so let's say if an object is a house right now you would have to create a blueprint of that house and that is what this class will give you so over here i am naming this class as test project and this is a function so main what you see over here this is called as a function and the execution of your program starts inside this main method so let's go to our presentation again so now that we've installed eclipse and seen how it looks like let's go ahead and write our first java program so we've already created our package we've also created our class and we also have this main function inside our class and i've told you that the program execution starts inside main so let's understand what are these exactly so over here class you can consider this to be a keyword so everything inside java needs to be inside a class and over here the name of the class is test and by convention you would have to give the name of the class with a capital letter so over here as you see the name starts with capital t now we have something known as an access modifier so over here this access modifier is public so what does this mean this means that this is a public class so this public class can be accessed by everyone so that is this public class can be accessed by everyone which is present in the program now inside this class test we also have this main function now let's understand this properly so before main you have something known as void so void is the return type of this function main now every function has a return type associated with it and for main function over here we've got void now what is void void means that it isn't returning anything and after that we again have public static so public over here means that this is a public function again and static means that this is a static function so a static function when you create it can be accessed without an object so normally if you don't add the static before a function then you would need an object to invoke that function now inside this main function i am writing my first line over here so i'm printing out this as part up so let's go to eclipse and print this out so this is our program over here 
Now let's go ahead and write our first program over here. So inside this, I'll just type in system.out.println system.out.println over here and I will write my first program. So I'll type in this is Sparta. So let's understand what is happening. So we know what a class is, we know the we know what a main function is and all we have to do is whatever code is there, all of that code has to be present inside this main function. Now after this, it is important that you end each line of the code with a semicolon. If you don't add a semicolon, then the compiler, the Java compiler would not know where the code ends. So that is why wherever you end a line, it is important that you put a semicolon over there. Right. Now, what does system.out.println mean? So for now, just understand that system is a class and println is a function which is present inside the system class, which helps you to print something out onto the console over here. And what are we printing? We are printing this particular sentence, which is this is Sparta. So we've written this program. Now let's go ahead and run it. So I'll click on run. Now again, I'll check this and let me click on OK. So we have successfully executed our first program over here and this is the result. So as you see, the result is this is Sparta. So guys, we have successfully written our first program. So now that we've written our first program, let's go ahead and understand what exactly are variables in Java. So whenever it comes to programming, it's very essential that we understand what data we are dealing with. And since every programming language deals with a lot of data, it's important to store that data somewhere. And this is where variables come in. So let's say I've got these three numbers over here, 10, 20 and 30, and I'd have to store this data somewhere. So what I'll do is I'll take a variable with the name my number and store this value inside this variable. So in simple terms, you can consider a variable to be a temporary storage space. So a variable is a temporary storage space where you store a lot of values. And over here, I am storing this value 10 inside this variable called as my number. So this is done over here. Now, as I've told you, a variable is a temporary storage space. So once you store a value, that value can actually be changed inside a variable. So let's say initially I store the value 10 inside this variable. So after some time, I want to change this value and store 20. Similarly, after some time, I want to change this value and store 30. So variable helps you to change values inside it. So again, if this seems confusing, let's go to Eclipse and work with this. Now let's go ahead and create a first variable. You need to understand that every variable is actually associated with a data type. So first you give in a data type. So over here I am creating an integer data type. So I'll type in int and then I'll give a name of the variable which is a. I'll give the equal to symbol over here and the value is 10. And since the line of code ends over here, I'll put a semicolon over here. So what I'm doing is I'm basically storing the value 10 inside this integer variable. Now let me go ahead and print out this value. So if I have to print, you would have to use this system.out.println command and store a inside this. Now let me go ahead and run this code over here. Let me click on OK. So as you see, we have successfully printed out the value which is present in this variable. Now, as I've told you, a variable is a temporary storage space. So you can actually change the values which are present in this variable. So instead of 10, let's say if I want to store 20, now 20 is stored in A and I'm printing out A again over here. So I click on run. And as you see, this time we have the result 20 instead of 10. Similarly, let me go ahead and change the value to 30 over here. Now again, I'm printing out the same variable, which is A, I'll click on OK. And again, as you see, the value 20 has been changed to 30 over here. So this is how we can work with variables. So in simple terms, variables are just temporary storage spaces. So now that we know what variables are, let's also understand what are data types and what are the different data types we can work with. So every variable is associated with a data type and we can have different types of data. So we can have integer values. So numbers such as 10, 500, 1000, minus one, all of these would constitute into integer variables. 
Then we have floating type variables. So values, whichever have decimal points. So let's say 3.14, 15.97 or 1000.0099. All of these are floating point numbers. And then we've got Boolean values. So Boolean values are just true or false values. And then we've got string values. So string values are stored in double quotes. So over here, Sam is a string value. Matt is a string value. So apart from this, we also have a lot of different data types. So for now, these are the most important data types and let's work with all of these data types first. So we've already seen an integer data type, what it is and how to print it out. Now let's go ahead and work with a floating data type. So I'll type in float and then again, I'll type in A over here and let me give in a floating point value. So I'll type in 3.14. Now, after you give a floating value, you would have to add the suffix F. So this would tell the compiler that this is actually a floating point value. And after that, you'll give in a semicolon and I'm printing it out over here. So let me click on run. And as you see, we have successfully printed out this floating point value. Now let me change this to something else. So I'll type in 12.76. Let me print this out over here. So this is our new floating point value. So we are done with a floating point value. Now let's go ahead and work with a Boolean value. So I'll just type in Boolean over here. And as I've told you, this has only two types of values, which is true and false. So I'll type in true and I'd have to give a name to the variable. So let's say I name this as logit and I am storing the value true inside logit. Now let me print out logit over here and let's see what do we get. So as we see, we have the result true. Now similarly, I can change this to false. So I'll store false inside this and I'm printing out the same thing over here. So this time we've got the result false. Now let's go ahead and work with strings. Now I'll type in string. So over here you have to keep in mind that S is capital. S is not small over here. So once you type in string and then give a value, which is the name of the variable over here. And inside this, let's say I type in Sam and then let me print out A over here again. So let me actually change this to small s over here. So we have some error again. So this is actually capital S and I'd have to put in a semicolon over here. Now let's print this out. So as you see, we have successfully printed out this value Sam, which is a string variable. Now, similarly, let me go ahead and change this value. I'll put in Bob, which again is stored in A and I'll print this out. Right. So again, we have printed out Bob. So these are the different types of data types which you can work with in Java. Now let's go ahead and work with operators in Java. So the most important types of operators are arithmetic operators, relational operators and logical operators. Let's start working with the arithmetic operators first. Now let's add a comment first. So put in two forward slashes and add arithmetic operators. What exactly is a comment? So let's say if you want to add a description and you want and you don't want that description to be compiled by your program. So that is where comments come in, right? So basically comments are pieces of description or basically those lines which are not executed by your compiler. And this helps a coder or someone who is going through the code to properly understand what exactly is happening in your program. So we were supposed to work with arithmetic operators. Now arithmetic operators simply put are plus, you've got minus, and then you've got multiplication, and then you've got division over here. So these are the different types of arithmetic operators. Now let's go ahead and work with some of these arithmetic operators. So I'll create one variable a and I'll store the value 10 inside this. After this, I'll create a new variable B and I'll store the value 20 inside this. So we've got two variables, 10 is stored in A, 20 is stored in B. Now let's go ahead and add these two values. So I'm adding A plus B inside the print statement. Let's see what is the result. We get a value of 30 because A plus B, 
10 is stored in A, 20 is stored in B, and when you add both of them, you get a value of 30. Now, similarly, instead of plus, let me put in minus over here. And when I execute this, I get a value of minus 10 because 10 minus 20 is minus 10. Now, let me go ahead and change this to multiplication over here. And this would give a value of 200 because 10 cross 20 is 200. Now, let me also divide these two. So A divided that by B, let's see what do we get? We get a value of zero. Now, isn't this strange? So 10 divided by 20 actually needs to be 0 0.5, but we've got zero. Why is that? Because we are actually working with integers over here. So 10 and 20 are integers and the result would also be an integer. So in that 0 0.5, zero is actually the integral part of it, right? And your integer is zero. So that is why we have this particular result over here. And if you want the decimal part as well, you would have to store this as a decimal. So you'll put in 10 F and 20 F over here, and you will change the data type of A to float. And similarly, you will also change the data type of B to float. Now, let me go ahead and execute this. So as you see, we have a result of 0.5 over here. So we're done with arithmetic operators. Now we'll go ahead and uh, work with relational operators. So I'll just put in relational operators over here. Now relational operators help us to understand the relationship between two operands. Again, let me go ahead and create my first variable over here. Let me give in proper spacing. So I'll store 10 inside A over here. Let me put in semicolon. Similarly, let me store B 20 inside B over here and then I'll put in a semicolon over here. Now, I want to understand whether A is less than B. So inside this print statement, I'm checking if the value of A is less than the value of B. Let me see what the result is over here. So I get true because 10 is less than 20. Now, let me check if A is greater than B. So again, let me click on run over here. And I get a false value because 10 is not greater than 20. Now let me go ahead and check if 10 is actually equal to 20. So this time I'd have to use the double equal to operator, which helps me to understand if the operands on the left and the right side of the symbol are equal or not. Again, I'll get a false value because 10 and 20 are not equal. Now I will check if A is not equal to B. So this is the not equal to operator exclamation mark and equal to operator that gives you the not equal to operator over here. And we have a true result because 10 is not equal to 20. So these were the relational operators. Now let's go ahead and work with the logical operators. So I'll add a comment over here, logical operators. And let me just put in what are the logical operators. So we've got and or now the AND operator gives you a true result only when both the operands are true. While when it comes to the OR operator, it gives you a true result when either of the operands is true. So let's work with some examples. Now I'll go ahead and create two Boolean values over here. I'll have Boolean A and I'll store the value of true inside this. And then I will also have boolean b and i'll store the value of false inside it so i've got two boolean values over here let me also put an exclamation mark over here right so i've got true and false now i will type in a and b let's see what do we get so over here this actually has to be and so you will put in the and operator over here now let me click on run so we get a false value because we have true and false and true and false gives you a false value. Now let me change this to B and A. So when I put in B and A, again, I get a false value because one of them is false. Now let me put in A and A. So when I have A and A, I finally get a true value because both of them are true. Now let me change this to B and B. So guys, what do you think would be the result over here? So obviously it's false because both of them are false. Now let's work with the OR operator. So I'll type in A OR A. So this is the OR operator over here. So you give the pipe symbol. That is the OR operator. You have a true result because both of the operands are true. Now let me change this to A OR B. 
Again, you have a true value because if one of them is true, the result would be true. Similarly, I'll change this to B, I will change this to A. And when I click on run, again, you have a true value. And finally, let me change this to B or B. So this is the only case where you have a false result. So summing it up, when you're working with the AND operator, you get a true result only when both of the operands are true. While on the contrary, when you're working with the OR operator, you get a true result when either of the operands is true. So till now we've looked at the basics of Java. Now let's go ahead and understand what are flow control statements. So the first flow control statement which we're going to work with is the F statement. So this is known as a decision making statement. Now let's understand this through a real world example. So there are a lot of scenarios where we'd have to make certain decisions which would impact our future. Now let's take a certain sort of example. So over here, let's say it's raining outside, but you want to go ahead and play football. So the condition over here is this. If it's raining, then you can't go out and play football and you'd actually have to stay inside and do something else. But on the other hand, if it's not raining, so else if it is not raining, then you can happily go out and play. So this is the if statement which you can use to depict the real world problems. So the idea is that if it's raining, then you can't go out and you'd have to sit inside and maybe watch a movie. On the other hand, if it's not raining, then you can go outside and play football. So similarly, let's take another example to understand if statement properly. So here, let's say you have given an exam and if you score more than 70 marks in the exam, then you'll get an ice cream. On the other hand, if you score less than 70, then you'd have to go ahead and give a practice test so that your marks can improve. So this is the sort of if statement which helps us to implement real world problems in the programming paradigm. Now let's go ahead and work with the if statement in Java. So this is how the if statement looks like in Java. So you're given if, which is the keyword over here. And then after that, you put in these round braces and you give the condition inside these round braces. So the condition is if 20 is greater than 18. So you're checking if the value 20 is greater than 18. And if this comes out to be true, you will go ahead and print out 20 is greater than 18. Now, similarly, we have another example over here. We've got two variables. So 20 is stored in X and 18 is stored in Y. And we are checking if Y is greater than X. So if this value evaluates to true, then we'll go ahead and print this. So is Y greater than X? This is actually false because 18 is not greater than 20 and hence we'll not be able to print this. So now since this is false, we'll skip this and then go ahead to the else statement. So here in the else statement, we'll print out X is greater than Y. So what happens here is if this evaluates to false, then we'll head to the else statement and whatever is present inside the body of the else statement that would be printed out. So let's go ahead and work with both of these examples. So let's work with the first example over here. I'll type in F, which is the keyword, and then I'll give the condition. So the condition is if 20 is greater than 18, and then I'll put in these braces over here, right? So these are the braces. Now let me also close this brace over here. So it's very important that you close a brace whenever you open. Now also see that I've not put a semicolon over here because if is a condition, this is not a single line of code. Now let me go ahead and print out the body inside this. So if 20 is greater than 18, then let me just put in system dot out dot print ln and I'd have to type out 20 is greater than 18. Let's execute this and let's see what is the result. So you see that there's an error over here. Now that error is I'd have to put a semicolon. Now that we've taken care of the error, let me go ahead and click on OK. And since this has been evaluated to true, that is 20 is actually greater than 18. So that is why we were able to print out this result. Now let me actually change this and let's see what happens. If 18 is greater than 20, then do this. Now we don't have any result over here. That is because this has been evaluated to false. And since this has been evaluated to false, 
whatever is there inside the body of this if condition that has been skipped out. So this was our first example. Now let's go ahead and work with the second example. So the second example we had two integer variables x and y in x I'm storing 20 and then let me go ahead and create the second variable over here. I'd actually have to put in a semicolon and then the second variable would be y and I'm storing let's say 15 inside this. So I've got my two variables ready and then I'd have to give in the if statement and I want to check if y is greater than x. So if y is actually greater than x, then I would have to print out system.out.println and I will print out y is greater than x. I'll put a semicolon over here. And if this evaluates to false, I'll put in else. I'll have to close this over here else system dot out dot print ln and this would be x is greater than y. So before I execute this think for a while and uh, what would you say is the result? Let me execute this now. So as you guys see this is the second one because y is not greater than x or in other words 15 is not greater than 20 so that is why whatever is present inside the body of f has been skipped out and then we head to else and whatever is present inside the body of else that will be printed out so we print out x is greater than y so this is the if else statement now there is something known as if else if statement so if we have multiple decisions to be taken care of, that is when we'll work with if else if statement. So over here, we've got different grades and according to the marks obtained by the student, we'll have to assign him a particular grade. So over here, we see that the student has scored 65 marks. Now we've got different categories over here. So if the student scores less than 50 marks, then he would have failed the exam. If the score is between 50 and 60, then the grade is D. Similarly, if the score is between 60 and 75, then the grade is C. And if the score is between 75 and 90, it's a B grade. And if it is between 90 and 100, it's an A plus grade. And if he scores anything else, then we'd have to print out invalid. Now let's understand this code properly. We'll start with the if statement and we are checking if marks are actually less than 50. So if this evaluates to true, we'll go ahead and print out fail. On the other hand, if this evaluates to false, we'll come down and we'll check over here. So here we've got two conditions which have to be evaluated. First condition is we're checking if marks are equal to greater than 20 and marks less than 60. This means that the mark should be between 50 and 60 where 50 is inclusive but 60 is exclusive. So if the student scores between 50 and 60, we'll go ahead and print out B grade. Now again, if this is also false, that is, if the student has scored above 60, then we'll go ahead and check if the marks are equal to greater than 60 and also less than 75. If this is the case, we'll print out C grade. Similarly, if this is also evaluated to false, then we'll come down, put in else if. So keep in mind that here the keyword is else if that is what we are writing over here and inside the third else if statement the condition is if marks are greater than equal to 75 and marks less than 90 we'll print out B grade and then we'll check if marks are between 90 and 100 and if that is the case we'll print out A plus grade and finally if none of these evaluate to true then we'll just print out the last else statement and inside the last else statement we'll put in invalid. This would mean that if the marks are greater than 100, right, which is actually invalid. Marks can be less than 50, but the marks cannot be greater than 100. So if that is the case, then we'll put in invalid. So let's go ahead and run this command in Eclipse. So let me first remove all of this. Let me cut out all of this over here. So I'll go ahead and create the marks variable over here and let's say the student has scored 65 marks. So we've got this ready. 
Now I'd have to go ahead and put in my first condition where I am checking if marks are actually less than 50. And if this is the case, I'd have to go ahead and print out. Let me put in system over here. System dot out dot print ln. So if the marks are actually less than 50, then I'd have to print out fail. On the other hand, I'll put in else if. So now I'd have to check if marks are equal to greater than 50. So if the first condition is false, then we are checking if marks are equal to greater than 50. And now I also want the marks to be less than 60. So if this is the case, then I will go ahead and print out. So instead of typing everything, let me just go ahead and copy this and I will paste it over here. So this time the grade would be equal to D. So I'll type in D grade. Then I'll put in the next else if condition over here. So this time, if these two conditions fail, then I'd have to check if marks are equal to greater than 60. I'll put in the AND operator and also the marks need to be less than 75. So if this is the case, again, let me put in the print statement, the grade would be equal to C. So I'll type in C grade over here. So if these three conditions fail, then we've got the next else if statement over here and I'd have to check. So this is actually 75 over here, not 65. So let me put in 75 over here, right? And I'd have to check if marks are actually greater than or equal to 75. And then I'll give in the next and operator. I'll type in marks which have to be less than 70. I'll open and close the braces over here. I'll put in the print statement and the grade would be equal to B. Let me put in B grade over here. Now, if this is also false, we've got again the else if statement and over here, I'd have to check if marks are greater than equal to 90 and also marks are less than equal to 100 because that is the maximum a student can score. I'll put in the print statement over here again. And this time if the student scores between 90 and 100, the grade would be equal to A. Now, if by any chance there's some printing error and it turns out that the student has actually scored greater than 100, which is not possible. So in that case, we'll print out system dot out dot print ln and we will type in invalid score. So we've got all of the code over here ready. Let me execute this and let's see what is the result. So we get C grade because the marks are 65. So we print out C grade. Now let me change this and let me put it to be 25 and let's see what is the result. So if it is 25, we get fail because obviously the if we are checking over here, if it is less than 25, then this evaluates to true and we print out fail. Now let me put in 120 and let's see what is the result now. We get invalid score because a student obviously cannot get more than 100 marks. Now let me put in 99 over here and let's execute this. See what is the result this time. And when the student scores 99, the grade is obviously A. Now we've got another example over here of else if statement. So this time we're checking if the number which we given is positive, negative or zero. So over here, the number is minus 13. So we start off with our first if statement and we are checking if number is greater than zero. So if the number is actually greater than zero, then we'll print out positive. If this evaluates to false, we'll come to the next else if statement and we'll check if number is less than zero. And if this evaluates to true, we'll print negative. On the other hand, if the number is not positive and also the number is not negative, then there's only one possibility that is for the number to be equal to zero. And that is what will print out in the last else statement over here, zero, right? So let's go ahead and execute this program. I'll cut all of this over here. Let me remove the existing code from this. 
Now I will go ahead and create a new number. Let's say int. I will name this to be num and I will store a value of 50 inside this. Now I'd have to give in the if statement and I want to check if num is greater than zero. So if number is greater than zero, then I'd have to print out. So let me put in this properly system dot out dot print ln and the result would be positive. So I'll type in positive number over here. I'll have to put in a semicolon. On the other hand, if the number is not positive, then I want to check if the number value is less than zero. So if this is the case, again, let me just go ahead and copy this from over here and paste it over here. I'll cut this. Now, if the number is actually less than zero, then I'd have to print out negative number. So let me just type out negative number over here. And if this also fails, then I'll put in the last L statement. The value would be equal to zero. So I'll just type in zero over here. So I've got all of my code covered. I'll hit on execute. Now, since the value is equal to 50, we get the value to be positive. Now let me put in a minus symbol over here. Now let's see what is the result. So when I put in minus over here, we get a negative number. Now let me remove this and let me set it to be equal to zero. And when the value is zero, we get this. So yes, this is how we can work with if, if else and the else if statement. So those were the decision making statements. Now in flow control statements, we've got something known as the looping statements. So these looping statements are used to repeat a task multiple times. So there would be a lot of real life situations where you'd have to keep doing the same task again and again. So what you're doing is actually looping. That is you're repeating a certain task. Let's take this example over here. Now let's say you've got a bucket and you have to fill up that entire bucket with a mug of water. So what you do is you take in a mug of water, pour into the bucket and you check if the bucket is full or not. If the bucket is not full, you again take a mug of water, pour it into the bucket. You check if the bucket is full or not. If it's not full, again, you take the mug of water, pour it into the bucket. So you keep doing this process until the bucket is full. So over here, the condition is until the bucket is full, you keep on pouring the mug of water into the bucket. So here you are going in a loop. Now, similarly, we've got this example. So many a times if we love a song very much, we keep repeating the song again and again. So this again is a case of looping statements. So here the condition could be until you close the app, you keep listening to the same song again and again. Then we've got another example over here. Now all of us work for money, don't we? Right. And at the end of every month, we get salary credited into our accounts. Now, that is a wonderful feeling. Absolutely. Isn't it? So this again is a looping statement over here. So at the end of every month, that is now if you consider 30 to be the end of every month, this is a repetitive task. So every month on the day, on the 30th day, you get money in your bank. So this is a task. This is a repetitive task, which happens at the end of every month. So these are some real life situations of looping statements. Now in Java, we've got two very important looping statements, which are while and for, and we'll understand both of them over here. So this is the pseudocode of while, and this is how we can work with while in Java. So let's understand the pseudocode over here. So first we enter the loop and then we check the test expression. So if the text expression is true, we enter the body of while, whatever is present inside the body of while will execute all of that. Now, after execution of it, again, we'll check the test expression. If that evaluates to true, we'll keep on executing whatever is there inside the body of while. And once the test expression evaluates to false, we'll exit the loop. Now, if that sounds complicated, we'll understand it with the help of this particular code over here. So over here, initially we've assigned the value of X to be equal to one. Now we enter this while loop. So here the keyword is while, right? You start with the keyword while and inside these round braces over here, you give in a condition, which is X is less than or equal to four. So here you're checking the value of X. Initially, the value of X is equal to one. 
So is one less than or equal to four that evaluates to true. And since that evaluates to true, you print out the value of X, which is one. Now, after that, you increment the value of X. So X plus plus would increment the value of X. It becomes two. Now here you again check if two is less than or equal to four. Now, since this evaluates to true again, you'll print out X, which is two. Then you'll increment the value of X. So now X becomes three. So now you'll again check if three is less than or equal to four, which is true. So you'll print out the value of X, which is three. Now again, you'll increment the value of X, which becomes four. So this time is four less than or equal to four. Well, this again evaluates to true. And then we print out the value of X. And now this time when we increment the value of X, it becomes five. So this time when we check is five less than or equal to four, this evaluates to false. And since this evaluates to false will finally come out of this loop. So we'll print out one, two, three, and four. And finally, when X becomes five, we come out of this loop. So let's go ahead and work with this example. I'll remove all of this. So initially we'd have to assign a particular value. So I'll take num to be my variable and I'll assign the value of zero in it. Now I have my while loop over here. So this is how you set the while loop and inside these round braces you given the condition. So the condition over here is num should be less than or equal to five. And I have the body over here. Let me put in the print statement system dot out dot print ln. And what do I want to print? I would want to print the value of num over here. And after printing it, I want to increment num value. So I'll type in plus plus num. So this is known as a unary operator. So plus plus num. So there are binary operators and new uh, unary operators. So till now we had to work with binary operators. So when you have a single operand and when you apply this plus plus on the single operand, this is known as a unary operator. All right. So now let me go ahead and hit on run. And this is the result over here. Let me just increase the size of this. So this is the result so 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5. So here when num value reaches 6. That is when this condition fails because when num is six and we check is if six is less than or equal to five, that evaluates to false and we come out of this while loop. So we're done with while loop. Now we've got a different type of loop, which is known as a for loop. So in for loop over here, you see that there are three conditions over here or basically three statements inside this round braces. So you start with the keyword for and inside the round braces, you've got the initialization phase. Then you have the condition checking phase and then you have the incrementation or decrementation phase. So you basically have three different things happening inside these round braces. First, you initialize the number. Next, you check the condition of that number which you have initialized. After that, this is upon you whether you want to increment or decrement that is totally upon you. So here we have initialized the I value to be equal to zero. Once this is initialized, we'll enter the body of fur and we'll print out I. So initially I is zero, we'll print out zero. We'll head back and now from here, we'll go ahead to this. I's value is incremented, it becomes one. Now after it is incremented, we'll check whether this incremented value is less than five. So it's one less than five, that is true. So we'll go inside the body and we'll print the value. So now we'll print out one. Again, we'll go back and this time I is incremented. I becomes two. Now we'll check whether two is less than five. This again is true. So we'll come inside. We'll print two. We'll go ahead. We'll increment the value of five. It becomes three. So it's three less than five. Well, this is true again. So this is how we'll print three. And then similarly, we'll print four. Now when I becomes five, we check the condition. So if five is less than five, that evaluates to false and we head out of this for loop. So with the help of this for loop, we get the value zero, one, two, three, and four. Similarly, we've got another example over here. So this time we have initialized the value of I to be equal to zero. Now our condition is if I is less than or equal to 10. So zero less than or equal to 10, that is true. So we'll print out zero. Of that, we'll head back and we'll increment the value of five. 
So 0 plus 2 will become 2. So it's 2 less than or equal to 10, that is true. And then we'll print out the value of i, which is 2. Again, we'll head back, we'll add 2 more to i. So 2 was there, 2 plus 2 becomes 4, we'll print out 4. Again, as 4 less than or equal to 10, that is true. We'll come down, we'll print 4. So this is how it becomes 6 and it also becomes 10. Now after 10, when we increment the i value, it becomes 12. So this time when we check, is 12 less than or equal to 10, that evaluates to false and we come out of this loop. So let's work with all of these examples. So the good thing about using a for loop is you don't have to initialize a variable out of the loop. But when it comes to a while loop, you need to have an external variable initialized. So I'll type in for, I'll have my variable initialized over here. So again, if you have to initialize a variable, you'd have to set the data type inside the for loop. So I'm setting for int i is equal to zero. So initially the value of i is equal to zero. Now I given the condition. So I want to check if, uh, now let me actually change it to 10. So if i is less than or equal to 10 and I want to increment the value with one. Now, let me put in the body over here. Let me use the print statement. So I'll type in system dot out dot print ln and inside this, I will print out the value of i and I'd have to give in a semicolon over here. It seems like we've got an extra brace over here, which I'll go ahead and delete. Now, let me execute this and let's see the result. So this is our result. So this loop starts at zero, goes on till 10. And when i value becomes 11, this condition evaluates to false and we come out of this loop. So this is what we get. Now, similarly, let's go ahead and set the i value to be equal to five. And let's set the uh, condition to be equal to 20. And I want to increment this with five. So this becomes i plus five, right? So we've got this set over here. Now let me actually, this has to be i equals i plus five because that is how we're incrementing this, right? So initially i value is five, which is less than 20. So we'll print five. Then it becomes five plus five, which is 10. So it's 10 less than or equal to 20. This is true. We'll print out 10. After that, i's value is incremented by five again. 10 plus five becomes 15 and then we'll print 15. 15 plus five becomes 20. So 20 is equal to 20 and that is why this is true. So we'll print out 20. And finally, when 20 plus five becomes 25, this evaluates to false and will come out of the for loop. So these were some basic examples of for loop. Now let's go ahead and work with a very uh, commonly occurring problem, which is known as the pattern problem. Now let's say if we want to print a pattern like this. So this pattern which you see, so we've got one star, in the second row, we've got two stars. Third row, we've got three stars. Fourth row, we've got four stars. And in the fifth row, we've got five stars. So if you want to do something like this, then we need the help of nested for loops. So what is a nested for loop? So in a nested for loop, you have one for loop inside another for loop. Let's understand this example over here. So since we want five rows over here, initially I am setting the value of five to this variable n. So n is initialized to five. Then I start this for loop over here. So over here, the for loop starts at zero and it goes on till n. So from zero till it'll go on till five. So that is zero, one, two, three, and four. Now, once this outer for loop is set, we'll go inside the inner for loop. So this, what you see is called as the outer for loop and this is the inner for loop. And in the inner for loop, I've got another variable. So here we had i, which started from zero, went on till n. Now we've got j inside the inner for loop. This starts at zero, but this will only go on till i. So here the condition is j is less than or equal to i. And inside this we'll print out star. Now let's understand this properly over here. So initially when i's value is equal to zero, so is zero less than five, that evaluates to true. So we'll come inside the body of outer for loop. 
and inside this j's value is equal to 0 and we are checking if 0 is less than or equal to 0 which is true because 0 is equal to 0. Since this is true, we'll come inside the body of the for loop and print this star which is what we have over here. Now once this is done, we'll go ahead and increment the value of j. So now j becomes 1. So this time we'll check if 1 is less than or equal to 0 which is false. So we'll come out of the for loop and we'll print out a new line over here. System.out.println will give you a new line. Now we'll again complete this, go back to the outer for loop. So this time i's value is incremented by 1, so i is 1 now. So is 1 less than 5, which is true. So we'll come inside the outer for loop. Now again the same thing will start. So j will start at 0. So 0 less than 1, which is true. So we'll print out a star. Again, we'll go back. This time j's value becomes 1. So is 1 less than or equal to 1, which is again true. So again, we'll come inside and we'll print out another star. Now j's value is incremented. So this time j's value is 2. So is 2 less than or equal to 1, which is false. So we'll come out of the inner for loop and we'll print out a new line. So we've got two stars, then we have a new line over here. Now we'll head back to the for loop, increment i value. So this time i value becomes 2. So is 2 less than 5, that is true, we'll come inside the for loop. Now again 0 which is less than 2. So 0, 1 and 2, that is why we have 3 stars over here. And when j becomes 3, this evaluates to false because 3 is not less than or equal to 2. So we'll come outside the inner for loop and print out a new line, right? So this is how this entire thing will go on. So when this becomes 4, when i's value, the outer for loop, in the outer for loop, i's value becomes 4, will head inside and 0 will go from 0 and j will go from 0 to 4. So we've got 0, 1, 2, 3 and 4. That means we've got 5 stars over here. And once we print the 5 stars, we'll come out of this. And after that, we'll finally increment the value of i when it becomes 5. So since 5 is not less than 5, we'll end the outer for loop as well. So this is how we can print out this pattern problem over here with the help of a nested for loop. So again, for all of the first timers, this might seem complicated. So let me just code and show you how this is done. So I'll erase all of this over here. So I'll set a value n to be equal to 5. So this is set. Now I would have to create an outer for loop. And inside this outer for loop, I am initializing the i value to be equal to 0. Now this will go on till 5. 5 is again exclusive. So this will be 0, 1, 2, 3 and 4. I'll put in a semicolon and then let me give in the incrementation over here. So i plus plus. I'll go inside the for loop and I'd have to assign the inner for loop. So this time I would have another variable which is j and j is initialized to 0. Now I'll give the condition. So the condition over here is j needs to be equal to or less than i. I'll put in a semicolon again and then I'd have to give in the incrementation which is again j plus plus. Now I'd have to enter the body of inner loop. Inside this inner loop, what do I have to do? I'll put in the print statement. So this will be system.out.println. So this actually is just print, not println. We don't want a new line over here. So I would need the star over here. Once I put in a star, so what I'll do is I will come out of this inner loop. And then I have a new system.out.println over here. So let me put in system.out.println and I would need a new line over here. So I'll execute this and let's see what is the result. So we've got the desired result over here, right? So one in the first row, we've got one star, second row, we've got two stars, third row, we've got three stars, fourth row, we've got four stars, and in the fifth row, we've got five stars, right? So if you don't understand this, you can go back and uh, listen to the explanation again. So the underlying concept is this. We've got the outer for loop and the inner for loop. The outer for loop will determine the number of rows we have, right? So we've got one, two, three, four, and five. 
So when i is equal to 0, this is our first row, i is equal to 1, second row, i is equal to 3, third row, i is equal to, so i is equal to 3, third row, and then, then i is equal to 4, this is our fifth row over here. Now, then we'll head on to the inner loop. So j will determine the number of stars which have to be printed. So when j is equal to 0, we have 1 star, when j is equal to a 1, we have 1, 2 stars. When j is equal to 2, we have 3 stars. j is equal to um, 3, we have 4 stars. When j is equal to 4, we have 5 stars, right? So this is how we can print out this pattern problem with the help of this nested for loop. Now let's go ahead and understand what are functions. Now, in your day-to-day -day activities, you would perform a lot of functions such as eating, running, cycling. So what exactly are you doing over there? Well, let's consider eating. Eating is a function, isn't it? So that's a task which you do every single day. Now, similarly, let's take running. What are you doing? So you're moving your hands and legs. Now that is a task which your body is doing. Similarly, if you take cycling, that again is a task where multiple parts of your body are moving at the same time, right? So all of these are tasks which you perform in your real life. Now, similarly, there are a lot of functions which you'd want to do in the programming paradigm. So basically, a function when it comes to Java is a specific block of code which performs a specific task. Now, let's say if you're writing a program and there are thousands of lines of code. So to properly understand what these thousands of lines of code is doing, then it'll be very cumbersome. So what you do is you take one specific task put it into a function and you can invoke that function whenever you want. So a perfect example for this to be for this would be the ATM machines. Now let's say when you go to the ATM machine and you'd want to deposit money, what do you do? You go ahead and press on the deposit button, right? So when you press on the deposit button, it automatically asks you how much would you want to deposit and then it updates the balance in your account. Similarly, when you click on the withdraw button, it asks you how much money would you want to withdraw and then again it updates it with your balance and similarly when you click on the balance button it would show your balance so what is happening each of these three buttons are performing a specific task when you invoke them and now let's say if you want to implement this atm machine in a programming paradigm how would you do it so this is where functions would come in so what you'll do is you'll write one function to deposit money and that function would have all of the code to let's say take money from the person and then update the balance. Similarly, you would create another function called withdraw, which would ask the person how much the person would want to withdraw and then update the balance. Similarly, when you create another function balance and then you write all of the code inside it, which would help a person to see the balance which is present in the account. So this is the basic idea behind functions. Now let's go ahead and see how can we create individual functions in Java. So till now we've been only working with one function, which is the main function. And as I've already told you, the main function as the name states is obviously the main function in your Java program and the starting of the execution and the ending of the execution happens at the main function. And whatever functions you create, are written separately outside of the main function and you can invoke all of these functions from inside the main function right now if this sounds confusing again let's understand these two examples and then implement them in eclipse so let's understand what is happening over here so over here we've got a function with the name sparta let's understand all of these words properly so here sparta is the name of the function void is the return type of the function Static is the access modifier of the function and then public tells you what is the access. So whether it is public, private or something else. And now out of all of these here, it is the name of the function, which you already know. Void is the return type. This means that this function doesn't return anything. Static over here tells the Java compiler that this function can be invoked directly from the main function. You wouldn't need an object of the class to invoke this function. And public over here would mean that any class can publicly invoke this function. And what is happening inside this function? 
This is just printing out the sentence. This is Sparta. Now over here, if you look inside this function, you see that it is blank. So when you compare this function with the second function, that is the difference between these two. Let's understand the difference. So over here, this is known as a non-parameterized function. This is known as a parameterized function. So over here, the name of the function is add, which is taking two parameters, int1 and int2. You have to keep in mind that if you pass in parameters inside a function, then you would also have to give in the data type of the parameter. So over here, we are passing in two parameters of integer type. And inside the function, we are adding those two parameters. So this is what the function is doing. So let's go to Eclipse and work with both of these functions and let's understand functions properly. So this is our main function and this is our class. And as I've told you, whatever other functions you would want to create, you would create it outside of the main function, right? So this, what you see is the body of the main function and whatever other functions or other methods you'd want to create, you will create them outside of the main function in Java. Now let's go ahead and create our first function, which was Sparta. So I would start off by giving the name of the function, which is Sparta. And then I'll give the return type. So the return type of this function is void. Then I will state that this is a static function, which would mean that this function can be directly invoked from the main function without the object of the class. And I'll also set the access to be public. I'll give an parenthesis over here and I will create the body of this function. So we have successfully created the template of this function called as Sparta. Now let me also go ahead and add in the body of this. So inside the body of this function, all I have to do is print in a sentence and that sentence would be, so this is actually system.out.println and I'd have to write over here, this is Sparta. So this is known as creation of a method. So now we have created a method. It's time to invoke the method. So we can invoke the method from inside the main class. Now, all I have to do is given the name of the function, which is Sparta, put in the parenthesis and then semicolon. So this is very important guys. I'm reiterating it. The function, you will create it outside of the main function. So whatever subsidiary functions are there, all of them you will create outside of the main function, but the invoking of the function or the calling of the function, you will do it inside the main function. So let me go ahead and run and let's see the result over here. Right? So we get the result. This is part of let's understand what is the flow of execution. So first we will enter this main function. Now, when we enter this main function, this is the body and inside the body of this function, the main function would encounter this Sparta function. Now, when it encounters this Sparta function, we will go ahead and come over here. Now, so this is basically redirecting to it. So this is known as calling a function. So from inside the main function, I am calling another function called as Sparta and I come over here and from over here, I'll go to the body of this function and I'll print out this as Sparta. Right. So guys, this was a simple example of how to create a function. Now let's go ahead and create a second function, which was a parameterized function. So just for practice for you guys, I'll delete all of this and I'll create the new function. So the name of the new function is void. Again, this does not return anything. So I'll add void over here, void add. And this again is a static function. So I'll add static over here. And this also is a public function. So public static void add, which is the name of the function. And inside this, there'll be two parameters. So the first parameter is integer a and the second parameter is integer b. And I have created the body of this inside this. Let me just add in the print statement, which will be system dot out dot print ln and this is printing out a plus b. So till here it's fine. Now a and b these parameters, the question which needs to arise in your mind is how are we going to pass in these parameters into this function called as add. So what we'll do is inside the main function, we will 
invoke the function add which is over here and will pass in the values inside this add function. Now to pass in the functions we already basically need to have some integer values. So let's go ahead and create those integer values. So I'll type in int a equal to 10. Let me go ahead and create the second integer value. So this will be int b is equal to 20. So I've got my two integer values over here a and b. Now let me pass in a comma b over here. Now let me hit execute and let's see what the result is. Right, so we get the result 30. Now let's understand the flow of execution over here. So we'll enter the main function because the program execution starts from the main function. So we'll enter the main function and inside the main function we'll initialize the variables a and b. So a is initialized to the value 10 and b is initialized to the value 20 and we'll pass in both of these parameters inside the add function. Now when we invoke this function add we go over here and these two values are passed inside this. So this value, so the first parameter 10 uh, goes into this. Similarly, the second value 20, which is stored over here goes into this. So this is how we are transferring the values from the main function to the add function over here. Now, once we pass in this values, we have 10 and 20 stored inside the local variables of this add function. And what we do is we just add up 10 and 20 because 10 is stored in A and 20 is stored in B. And when we add these two values, the result which we get is 30. So this is how we have created a subsidiary function called add and we have invoked that function from the main function. So those were functions without any return values. So for them, the return value was void. So now we'll go ahead and create a new function which actually returns a value and it is not a static function. So guys, can you have a look at this function over here? So here the name of the function is add, which is same. Again, this takes in two parameters, which are num1 and num2. So this takes in two integer parameters, but these two, which you see over here, these are different from our earlier functions. So this time the return type is int instead of void. So now in the earlier two functions when the return type was void, that basically means that the function did not have to return anything. But over here, this add function has to return an integer value. And this again is of public type. And since we have not given the static value over here, this would mean that if we have to invoke this function from inside the main function, then we'd have to create an object of our class. So if it's clear till now, then let's understand what is happening inside the body of this add function. So this is the return type of int. We have two parameters num1 and num2. Now instead of just printing out num1 plus num2, what we do over here is we'll add num1 plus num2. We'll store the result in this new object called as result and we'll return out this variable named as result. So as you see, this is an integer variable and that is what we are returning over here. Now this is being returned. So let's understand what is happening in this main function over here. So the execution starts over here. Now inside this, we will create an object of our class and this is how we can create an object of our class. So the name of our class is test project. So we'll type in test project and this is how we can create a new instance or a new object of our class. So given the name of the class space and then given the name of the object or the name of the instance. So over here, this is the name of our object and that is obj and we'll give an equal to, we'll add new test project. So this means that we are basically creating a new object or a new instance of the class test project and we are storing it in this variable called as obj. So I'll repeat it. We are creating a new object or a new instance of the test project class and we are storing it in this variable named as obj, right? So we have successfully created our object of this class with the name obj. After that, since we have to pass in parameters inside this function, we'll create in two values which are 10 and 20. So the value 10 has been assigned to x and the value 20 has been assigned to y. Now after this, we invoke the function add 
And since this is not a static function, we'd have to invoke this function with the help of this object. So now the name of the object is obj. So we'll type in obj dot add and we'll pass in these two values, which are x and y. So obj dot add and we pass in x and y and we'll store this result in a new object called as get result. Now before going there, let's understand what is happening over here. Now when I call this function with the help of this instance, so when I type in obj dot add and I pass in x and y, this directly redirects to over here. So I am calling this function. When I call this function, my Java compiler redirects me over here. So x, the value which is stored in x, n1 gets stored in num1. Similarly, the value which is stored in 20 over here, y, this value gets stored in num2. So that is why we have 10 in num1 and 20 in num2. And when we add 10 plus 20, we get the value of 30, which gets stored in result. And then we return result, which is actually 30. So whatever is happening inside this, the final value returned by this function is 30, right? So this, when everything is done, it will give out the value 30, which is stored in this get result object. And that is what we are printing out over here. So system dot out dot print and get result and the value 30 is stored in this get result object. So now if this is still confusing, let's go to Eclipse as we always do and let's implement this over there. So let me go ahead and delete this out over here. Let me also cut this out over here. Now my task would be to create this new function. So this is a public function and this is actually returning an integer value. So it will be public int add and it takes in two parameters. So the first parameter is int a and the second parameter is int b. So I've got my two values set over here. And what I'll do now is I will create a new variable named as result, which will have the added values of a and b. And I'd finally have to return the value which is stored in result. So I've successfully returned this value. Now it's time to invoke this function. And to invoke this function, we need an object of this. So I'll give in the name of the class, which is test project. And let me create the instance, which is obj. So here I'd have to type new. This will be test project again. So I have successfully created the instance of this test project class. And after that, I will type in obj. And with the help of this, I'd have to invoke the add method. And since we have to pass in values inside this add method, let me go ahead and create some values. So let's say in X, I would store the value of 10. And similarly in Y, I would store the value of 20. So I've got these two values stored and I will pass in X over here and Y over here. So X gets stored in A, Y gets stored in B and we'll get a final result. So that final result I'll be storing in int get result. So all of this is done. Now the only thing which I'd have to do is print out the result. So I'll type in system.out.println and I'd have to print out get result over here. I'll put a semicolon. Now let me actually just change these values. So I'll set X as 100 and Y as 200. Now let's see what is our new result over here. So we see that our new result is 300. So this is how we can create a function with a return value. Now there's this very famous example when it comes to methods in Java, which is known as a swap function. So what we do in this is we take in two values and swap the values which were earlier present in the two variables. So let's say we have two variables named A and B and 10 was stored in A and 20 was stored in B. Now our task is to swap the values. So this is swap the values, then 20 needs to go into A and 10 needs to go into B, right? So whatever is present in A should go into B and whatever is present in B should go into A. So this is the function for it. So we'll uh, give the name of the function as swap function. So this is totally dependent on you. You can give the name whatever you want. 
And once this is done, you'll go inside the body over here and you're typing out or printing out before swapping A equals A and B equals B. So basically you're showing what were the initial values of A and B. So this plus symbol is basically to differentiate whatever is there as a string and whatever is a variable over here. So this is a string. So you're typing out before swapping A equals A. And then you'll type out B equals B. So over here you'll get the value which is stored in A and over here you'll get the value which is stored in B. So here you're basically showing the values which are there before swapping. And once you're done with that, you will go ahead and take the value which was stored in A and store it back into C over here. So let's say the value which was stored in A is 10, then you'll take 10 and store it into C. So now C has the value 10 in it. Now you'll store the value of B into A. So if 20 was present in B, 20 will go into A. So initially A was 10. Now since I'm assigning B to A, A's value has changed from 10 to 20. After that, I am assigning the value of C to B. And since 10 was present in C, I am taking that 10 and storing it into B. So when you perform this entire action, what is happening is you are changing the value of A from 10 to 20 and you're changing the value of B from 20 to 10. And this is how we swap the values. Now, once the swapping is done, all you have to do is show up the result. So over here, you're typing out after swapping A equals 20 and B equals 10. So let's go ahead and create this swap function in Eclipse. So let me go ahead and cut this all out from here. Let me also delete this function and let me create a new function over here. So I'll type public and then I'll type in void over here. Now this is also static. So I'll type in static, so public static void and the name of the function would be swap function and this takes in two integer values. The first integer value is A and the second integer value is B. I'll uh, have the body over here. Now my first task would be to store the value of A into C. So whatever was stored in A goes into C. Now what I'll do is I'll change the value of A. So whatever was stored in A, sorry, whatever was stored in B goes into A. And after this, I'll take the value of C and store it into B. So this is how we can swap the values. Now, once the swapping is done, I'd have to show the swapped values. So first I'd have to show the original values. So I'll type in system.out.print Allen. So let me take this original values. So A is equal to A and I'll add another plus over here to separate the variables from the string. And then B is equal to, I'll add a plus and this will be B again. So A is A and B is B. I'll take the same thing and I'll paste it over here. So we have created this function. Now it's time to invoke it. And to invoke it, we obviously need some values in the main function. So let me take X to be equal to 10 and let me take Y to be equal to 20. Now let me go ahead and invoke the function over here. So this will be swap function and I'd have to pass in X over here as the first parameter and Y over here as the second parameter. So I'll just click on run and let's wait for the magic. So as you see, original values 10 and 20. So these are not original values. These are duplicated values or swapped values. So I'll change this as swapped values. Now I'll click on run and then we have perform magic. So what was uh, stored in A has gone into B and what has what was stored in B has gone into A. So A is 10, B is 20. And after swapping values, we've got 20 in A and 10 in B. Now we'll go ahead and understand what is method overloading. So many times it happens in Java that we've got multiple functions and most of those functions can have the same names. 
Now, in this case, when you're invoking these multiple functions from the main function, there could be a possibility of ambiguity. So let's understand it with this example over here. So let's say we've got two functions with the name area over here, right? So as you see, we have two functions and the name of both of the functions is area. But what is actually differing over here is the type and the number of parameters inside both of these functions and also the return type. So in the first function over here, we are finding out the area of a rectangle. And since to find out the area of a rectangle, we need the length and the breadth. So that is why this is taking two parameters. And over here, I am finding out n1 into n2 and then I'm returning it. So also I'm returning an integer value over here. But in the second function, I'm finding out the area of a circle. So the second function takes in only one parameter and this returns a float value. So as you see over here, 3.14 F into N into N. And since this 3.14 is a floating value, that is why I have added the suffix F after this. So this is how method overloading works. So we have two functions or more than one functions and these multiple functions would have the same names. But what actually differs is the types and the number of parameters which go into these functions and also the return type of these functions. Now, when we go ahead and load both of these functions into the main function, what tells the main function that both of these are different is the difference in the parameters and the difference in the return type. So let's go to Eclipse and work with these method overloaded functions. So let me go ahead and delete all of this first. So we would not require the earlier functions. Let me also delete this, right? So we've got our uh, main function. We've also got the class set over here. Now it's time to create my first function over here. And the name of the function is obviously shape. This is a public function. So I'll type in public and this will return an integer value. So I'll type in int. And what I'm trying to calculate is the area of a rectangle. So I'll add area over here and this takes in two parameters. Both of them are integers by the way. So I'll add int n1 and after this there'll be int n2. So I've got both of these set. Now I'll go ahead and add the body over here. So I'd want to find out the area of a rectangle. So I'll add, so basically the result would go into this variable and the area of the rectangle is basically length into breadth. So that would be n1 into n2 and I'd have to return this. So return of result. So we have created this first function. Now similarly, let me go ahead and create the second function over here. So again, this is a public function. Now the return type of this is float. And again, the name of the function is area, but this would take in only one parameter and which would be of integer. So I'll add n over here. And this, since this is of, uh, this is returning a floating type. So I'll add float result over here. So let me just add result and I will add over here 3.14 into n into n because n over here would be the radius of the circle and the radius and the area of the circle would be pi r square. So this is the value of pi 3.14 and pi r square. So this would be 3.14 into n into n. Now we just have to return the result. So I'll add return of result. So we have successfully done this. So seems like there's a problem over here. Let's understand what exactly is it? Right. So this is of floating type. So I'd have to add 3.14 F. So both of our methods are ready over here. Now it's time to invoke both of them. So for this, I'd have to have my local variables over here set. So I'll have int X and I'll store the value of 10 inside this. Then I'll have int Y and have the value of 20 stored inside this. Now I'll also have the radius of the circle set. So int r and I want the radius of the circle to be equal to five. I've got my local variables ready. Now it's time to invoke the function. Now, since this is not a static function, again, I'd have to go ahead and create an object out of this. So I'll type 
test project over here and I'd have to create an object. So I'll set OBJ over here and I'd have to create a new class. So new of test project and I have successfully created an instance of this. Now with the help of this instance, I can invoke both of the areas. So as you see in the prompt, you have two area functions. The first area function takes in only one parameter. The second area function takes in two parameters. Now I'll invoke the first area function over here and inside this I'll pass R. After this, I'll type in OBJ. Again, I have the area function over here. This takes in two parameters. Now I'll add X over here and I'll pass Y over here. Right. Now, since this gives me the area of the circle, I'll store this in actually a floating type. So float, I'll name this as area circle. And since this gives me an integer type, I'll have an integer type over here. So int and this would be area of a rectangle. So let me type in rectangle over here. Right. So we've got the results stored in area circle and area rectangle and I just have to print out the result. I'll type in system.out.println since we want a new line over there. So first I want to print out the area of the circle. So I'll type in, let me just put in properly over here, area of the circle is and the area of the circle would be area circle. Now similarly I would want to print out the area of the rectangle. So let me change this from area of the circle S to area of the rectangle S. So this will go from area circle to area rectangle. Now let me go ahead and just print this out and let's see what the result is. So we see that the area of the circle is 78.5 and the area of the rectangle is 200. Now let's go ahead and understand what exactly are arrays in Java. So simply put, Arrays help us to store multiple elements of the same data type. So till now we were working with variables and when it came to variables, the major limitation was you could store only one element or one value in a variable. But there are a lot of situations in real life where you'd have to store multiple elements in the same storage space. Now let's say you want to store the names of all of the students present in a class. So what would you do? Would you actually create one individual variable for all the students? Now let's say there are 100 students present in the class. So there are 100 students, then you'd have to create 100 variables for all of the students and store their names. Now let's say if you also have to store their marks, then you'd have to create 100 more variables to, to store the marks of all of these students. Now the better situation over here is to actually use an array. So over here, instead of creating 100 new variables, what we'll do is we'll create one array which can store 100 names, all of the 100 names of the students. Now it has to be kept in mind over here that an array can store elements of the same data type. So you can't store one character value and one integer value in the same array or one logical value and one string value in the same array. So you'd have to make sure that all of the elements whichever are stored in the array, they are of the same type. And this is the example of an array. So we've got an array over here whose size is nine and the indexing in an array starts with number zero. So this goes from zero to seven. So there are actually the size of the array is seven over here. So this goes from zero to six. So one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. So the size of this array is seven and the indexing over here starts from zero. Now this is the basic idea behind an array. So array can store multiple elements of the same data type and the indexing of an array starts with zero. So now that we know that, let's go ahead and create some arrays in Java. So this would be the syntax to create an array. So first you'll given the data type of the array. So over here I want to create a character type array. So I'll type in char and then I'll give in the square braces. After that I'll give in the name of the array and I'd have to allocate memory to this. 
Now I want five elements of the same type in this array. So I'll give in new char five. So what I'm basically doing is I am creating a new character array with the size five or basically five elements of character type can be stored in this array named as A. Now once I do that, I can go ahead and assign the values to each of these individual indexes. So at A0, I'm storing A. A1, B is stored. A2, C is stored. A3, D is stored and A4, E is stored. So you'd have to keep in mind that since the indexing starts from zero, so if there are five elements, then you can only store up to index number four because again, I'll repeat it, the indexing starts at zero. So this is how you'll store the arrays in Java. So now that we know how to store arrays, we'll go ahead and print out the values which are present in this array. So to print out the values, you would need this for loop. And since there are five elements in this array, the variable i inside this for loop will start at zero and will go on till five. So again, over here, five is exclusive. This would mean that i's value will go from zero to four. Now we'll go inside this for loop, the body of the for loop, and we'll print out a of i. This would mean a0, a1, a2, a3, and a4. So initially when i's value was zero, we'll print out a0, that is a. Now i's value is incremented, it becomes one, and we'll print out a1, so we'll print out b. Similarly, i's value is incremented, it becomes two, and then we'll print out a2, which is c. And then in the similar way, we'll print out a3 and a4 as well. So let's go ahead and work with this example in Eclipse. So our first task would be to create this character array. So it is actually char. I'll give in the square braces over here. I will name my array as a and I will allocate it memory. So this will be new character and inside the parenthesis over here, I want a array which would store five characters, right? So I have created this array successfully. Now it's time to store values inside this array. So the indexing starts from zero. So in a zero, I will store a. Now what I'll do is I'll just do control C, control V so that I can just change these values. Right. So in a one, I am storing B. In A2, I am storing C. In A3, I am storing D. And in A4, I am storing E. So I've also assigned values inside the indexes of these arrays. Now it's time to finally print out all of the values. And to print out the values, we've already seen that we need a for loop. So over here, I'll set for int i is equal to zero and this would be less than five. So this will go from zero, one, two, three, and four, i plus plus, and then I'd have to print out the value. So this will be system dot out dot print ln, and I'd have to print out a of i over here. Let's execute this and let's see what is the result. So we have successfully created an array and we have also printed out the values which were present in this array. Now let's go ahead and create another array where we are also inserting the values inside this array with the for loop. So over here we have an integer array with the size 10. That would mean that this will store 10 integer values and i's value will go from zero to nine. So we actually seem to have the syntax incorrect over here. Since this is an array of size 10, we will set i to go on till 10 over here. And then what we'll do inside this loop over here is we will assign in ai. So ai is the value which gets stored in the index i and we'll store i over here. So at 0th index, we'll store 0 and i is incremented. Now at index 1, we'll store 1. Similarly, at index two, we'll store two. At index three, we'll store three. So this is how we'll store all of the values. And once the values are stored, we'll go ahead and print out the values. Now let's go ahead and uh, create that integer array over here. So this will be int. And again, I'll name this array as a. So new int, and I am assigning the size of 10 over here. So now that this is done, I'd have to insert the values through this for loop. 
So over here, int i would be equal to zero and the value will be less than 10 and I'd have to increment this. So now that those three parameters are set inside the for loop, I'd have to go ahead and insert the values inside array a. So this will be a of i and inside a of i, I'll just store i. So we have successfully inserted the values. Now it's time to print out the values. So again for int i is equal to zero, i is less than 10 and this will be i plus plus. Now I'll have to print out the values. So this will be system.out.println and this will be a of i. So this is how I can print out all of the values. I'll hit execute and let's see what is the result right now. So we have created a new array and in that new array we had stored the values from 0 to 9 and we have also printed out the result. Right. So let me close this up over here and let me go to the console. Now let's look at a very popular example when it comes to arrays in Java. So let's say we have two arrays over here. Let's call this array A, let's call this array B. And we've got these values stored inside these two arrays. So 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4 are stored in array A. 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 have been stored in array B. Now what we'd have to do is, we'll have to add the individual values present in the indexes. So we'd have to add these two values present at index 0 and we'd have to store it in a new array. Similarly, we'd have to add these two values, store it over here. Add these two, store it over here. So let's go ahead and perform this. So to perform that, we would need three arrays. Let me start off by creating my first array, int a. And over here, I will set the size to be equal to 5. We've got array a to be ready. I'd have to give in new over here. So guys, you'd have to remember that if you don't give new, you'll get an error. So we've got our first array set. Now let me go ahead and create the second array. I'll name it as B. This will be new int and the size of this array is five again. Now I'll go ahead and create array C. Int C is equal to new int five. So we've got our three arrays set. Now let me go ahead and insert the values into array A. So I'll start the for loop over here for int i is equal to 0. i will go up to 5 where 5 is exclusive. That would mean i's value would be 0, 1, 2, 3 and 4. And I will increment it over here. So I'll just type in i plus plus. So now that this is done, I'd have to insert the values. So inside AI, I'll just go ahead and assign the value of I. So we've got our first array to be set. Now let me go ahead and insert values into the second array. So again, it'll be the same thing. For int I is equal to zero, I is less than five, I plus plus. Now once I go inside this, I'd have to assign values, but for this I'd have to have another integer variable which is initialized to 5 because the values inside the new array would start at 5 and will go on till 9. So what we'll do inside this is we've got b over here. So in b of i, I am assigning num and I will increment the value of num after each assignment. So in b0 we'll have 5, in b1 we'll have 6, in b7 we'll have 7. So this is how it will keep on going on, right? So now that we have also inserted the values in array a and array b, let me go ahead and print out the values of array a and array b. So Again, I would need a for loop for that. So let me just copy this for loop. I don't want to write the entire thing over here. And before this, I'll just put in system dot out dot print ln. I'll add values of array a. Let me make it capital and over here 
I'll add another system dot out dot print statement. So this is keep in mind I'm adding a print statement, not print ln statement over here. And I'll be printing out a of i. So these are the initial values of array a. Now similarly, I'd have to print out the values of array b. So over here, system dot out dot print ln values of array b. And this would be b of i. So we've got the original values printed out. Now it's time to add the values of a and b. So I'll have a new for loop over here for int i is equal to zero, i is less than five, and it will be i plus plus. Now we've got our new array created over there. So let's go ahead and add the values inside this new array. So this will become C of I is equal to A of I plus of B of I. So let me just add in B of I over here. We've got our new array as well. Now it's time to just print out our final array, which is the result. Let me copy this and paste it over here. So values of array C let me also just add a space over here so that it's easy for us to understand this. So a plus symbol and then a space. So we can't have a comma over here that has to be a plus symbol. And similarly, I'll add a plus symbol over here and then I'll add a space. And that is what I'll do over here. This has to be array C, a plus symbol and then a space. So let me print this out and let's see what is the result now. Right, so we've got values of array A, which is 0, 1, 2, 3 and 4. So we've got a new line over there, which has to be removed. So let's just correct this properly. So we have values of array A and this I'll remove the print ln from over here. Now, after this is done, let me hit enter and let's see what do we get. So we have values of array A and after 0, 1, 2, 3 and 4, I would need, so this wouldn't be a print ln over here. I would have to add a new line over here and I'll execute this. So we've got this ready as well and values of array C, I'd have to put in a new line over here, which will be slash N and I'll also remove this. Now I'll hit run. So we've got all of this set. So initially we had created two arrays A and B. In A we had 0, 1, 2, 3 and 4 and in array B we had 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 and we had created another array C and with the help of the for loop, we have added these two values. So five plus zero gives us five, six plus one gives us seven, seven plus two gives us nine, eight plus three gives us 11 and nine plus four gives us 13. Now, if this seems confusing to you, I'll just go ahead and repeat the entire thing, whatever we've done over here. So we started off by creating or initializing three arrays over here, A, B and C. Now, after initializing these three arrays, I went ahead and added values inside array A. So inside array A, I've added 0, 1, 2, 3 and 4. After that, I have added values inside array B. So inside array B, I've added 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Now that was done. I had printed out the initial values of array A and array B. So after printing out initial values of array A and array B, I created another for loop and inside this for loop, I have added the individual values of array A and array B and stored them into the indexes of array C. So AI plus BI, what you see is this will add the individual indexes values of array A and array B and store it to the corresponding index value of C. And once that was done, I have finally printed out the result of array C. So that was a single dimensional array. Now let's understand what is a multi-dimensional array and how can we create multi-dimensional arrays in Java. So in a single dimensional array, as the name states, it was in a single dimension. So you did not have rows and columns in it. But in a multi-dimensional array, you would have rows, 
and columns. So as you see, this is a multi-dimensional array and you have rows over here and columns over here. So this cell over here, now let's say if the name of the array is A, this value would be present at A00. Similarly, if you take this, this would be present at A11. And if you take this, so this value would be present at A12. So this is how we can work with multidimensional arrays. Now let's see how can we create a multidimensional array in Java. So this would be the syntax to create a multidimensional array. So the name of the array is A and over here, as you see, we are adding two parentheses or two square braces over here because this is a two dimensional array and new int three, three. This would mean we are creating a three cross three metrics. And over here, I'll start the for loop and inside the for loop, I'll add another for loop. So this is the outer for loop. This is the inner for loop. The outer for loop over here, initially i's value is zero. Now when i's value is zero, we'll head inside the inner for loop. Now j's value will go from zero, one and two. Now inside this, we'll add values in a00, a01 and a02. So in a00, we'll add one and plus plus num. So num in gets incremented by one. After that in a01, we'll add one. Again, num gets incremented. In a02, we add num, so num's value is two. Now, since j has reached its limit, we'll come out of the inner loop, we'll go to the outer loop, and we'll increment the value of i. So now i becomes one. We'll come inside over here, and now we'll start storing values at i, one, zero, a, one, one, and a, one, two. Again, we'll go ahead, i's value is incremented, it becomes two. So this time we'll come inside and now we'll start storing values at a20, a21 and a22. So once we've stored all of the values, we'll go ahead and print out the values. So again, to print out the values, we would need two for loops. This is the outer for loop, this is the inner for loop. And we'll just print out a, i, j. Now this a, i, j after the so after each row, I'll print out a new line. So initially we'll print out 0, 1, 2, and then there'll be a new line. After that, we will have 3, 4, 5, then we'll have a new line. Then we'll have 6, 7, 8, and then we'll have a new line. So let's go ahead to Eclipse and implement all of this. So let me cut out the earlier code from over here. Let me just go ahead and delete all of this. We would not require this at this point of time. So we have an extra breeze over here. We also don't require this. Now it's time to create a multidimensional array, int a. So this is a two dimensional array over here. I will add new int and again. So I would have one more brace over here. So this is a three cross three matrix. So I'll add three, three over here. So we have initialized our uh, three cross three integer matrix. Now it's time to add values inside this multidimensional array. So I'll have my outer for loop ready for int i is equal to zero, i is less than three, i plus plus. So this is our outer for loop. Now I'd have to create the inner for loop. For int j is equal to zero, j is less than three, j plus plus. Now I'll enter inside this inner for loop and I'd have to assign the values. So over here to assign the values, I would need my integer num value. So I will store zero inside this. Now a i comma j. So initially this will be zero zero. So in a zero zero, I will be storing num and I will keep on incrementing it after each iteration. So this will be plus plus num. So we have successfully added all of the values inside this array. Now it's time to print out the values. So again, to print out the values, we'd have to do the same thing over here. So I'll type in for int i is equal to zero, i is less than three, i plus plus so we've got our outer for loop ready now it's time to create the inner for loop for int j is equal to zero j is less than three 
and then this will be j plus plus now i'll go inside this for loop over here and then i'll print out the values so to print out the values i'll type in system dot out dot print ln so i'll just keep it to be print over here and this will be a of i j and let me add a space over here so now that this is done i will go ahead and add a new line over here so after every row i will be adding a new line so that we know how the matrix looks like this over here would be system system dot out dot print ln so we are ready with our code i'll just go ahead and click on execute so we have successfully created a two dimensional matrix or a two dimensional array where we have three rows and three columns 0 1 and 2 is in the first row 3 4 5 in the second row and 6 7 8 is in the third row fine now let's go ahead and understand what is object oriented programming so i have already informed you guys during the beginning of the session that java is a pure object oriented programming language and i've also told you that all of us are surrounded with lots of objects so when you look around you, whatever you see, all of them are objects. So when you see a phone, what is that? That is an object. When you see a bike, that again is an object. And when you see a dog, what is that? That is a living object. Now, if you want to implement all of these in the programming paradigm, you would need a object oriented programming language. And that is where Java comes in. Now, object oriented programming language has two main concepts which are classes and obviously objects. So let's understand what are classes. So you can consider a class to be a template or a blueprint for real world entities. Now let's consider this phone over here. So this phone needs to have a template or a blueprint. So when you look at a phone, whatever phone that is, that would definitely have a blueprint to it. Now this template would again have two things. The first thing would be the property. Second thing would be the behavior. So a phone has certain properties associated with it. So those properties would be, let's say, the color of the phone, the cost of the phone and the battery life of the phone. Now, apart from the properties, a phone would also have certain behavior associated with it. So the behavior could be, let's say, making phone calls, watching videos on the phone or playing games on the phone. So whatever object you take, that object has a template to it and this template again has two things so uh, that template would have properties and also a behavior now we've understood what exactly is a class with respect to the real world now let's understand what is a class in java so simply put a class is a user defined data type so similar to the uh, data types which we have in the programming language which are int float and character and string we have a user defined data type so that is you have a data type which the user can create so over here mobile is a class which is nothing but a user defined data type now this user defined data type which is basically our class has attributes and methods inside it so these attributes are nothing but the properties of the class and these methods are nothing but the behavior associated with the class so color and cost are the attributes and methods are basically playing game and making a call. And now we've understood what is a class. Let's understand what are objects. So objects are specific instances of a class. So if we take the example of a phone, then that phone would be the template or the class. And this phone would have a lot of brands, right? So Apple is an object of a mobile phone. Motorola is an object of a mobile phone. Similarly, Samsung is an object of a mobile phone. So these are specific instances of the class named as phone. So we have got the basic gist of object oriented programming and we've also understood what are classes and what are objects. Now let's go ahead and create our first class in Java. So till now we've been working with only one class, which is our main class. And inside that main class, we would have the main function. Now we'll go ahead and create subsidiary classes. So these subsidiary classes will not have the main function inside of them. So what we're going to do is we'll create a class with the name student. Now, as I've told you, a class would have behavior as well as properties. 
So as you see over here, we have attributes inside this class. So the student will have a name and the student would also, let's say, score certain number of marks in a particular subject. So these are the attributes of this class named as student. Now, apart from the attributes, as I've told you, a class would also have behavior associated with it. So that behavior can be denoted with the methods over here, right? So this behavior is nothing. So we'll just print out the name of the student and also the marks scored by the student. So let's go ahead and create a first. Now this is our default class or the main class which has the main function inside it. We have to create a second class over here. So this is our package test project. I'll right click on this. I'll click on new and I'd have to create a new class. And by convention, the first letter of the class name should be capital. So I'll have capital S over here and I'll give the name of the class as student. And I'll not check this because this class will not have the main function. So we have created our class named as student. Now, as I've told you, this will have certain attributes with it. So the first attribute would be the name of the student, which would be of string type. So string name. And let's say the name of the student is Bob. Now, similarly, Bob would have scored certain sort of marks in the math exam. So int marks and let's say Bob has scored 75 marks. So we've got the attributes ready. Now I just have to show these details. So this would be a public function and this function doesn't return anything. So public void and I am naming the function as show details. So let me just write it properly over here. Show details and this does not have any parameters. All it does is it prints out the name of the student and the marks scored by the student. So this will be system.out.println and I'll add name of the student is. So the name of the student is stored in the variable name. Similarly, I'd have to print out the mark scored by the student which would be system.out.println and over here I'll type in marks scored by the student R and over here I'll add in marks. So we have successfully created this. Now I'll go to the main class. Now if I have to call these methods or these properties from inside this, I'd have to create an object of this class. Only then I'll be able to invoke all of these. So let me go ahead and create an object of the student class. So I'll give in the name of the class with the student and I'll give the name of the object as OBJ. Now if I have to instantiate it, I'll just type in new student. So I have successfully created an instance or an object of this class named as student. Now with the help of this object, I can invoke the functions which are present in the student class. So obj dot show details. All I have to do is click on run and I'll be able to show the details of the student. So as we see, we have got name of the student as Bob and marks scored by the student are 75. So by this way, even though this class is a separate class, I'm able to invoke the show details function from within my. Now let's see how can we take an input from the user. So till now we've been doing a lot of hard coding. Now let's see how can we take an input from the user and show it out. Now to take an input from the user, we would require the scanner library. So this is a class. Scanner is a class and we'd have to use this scanner class to take input from the user. So we'd have to create an instance of this first. So over here, this is the same student class which we have and inside the student class, I am creating an instance of the scanner object. So now inside this, I'll type scanner scan is equal to new scanner. And uh, since I have to take the input, I'll type in system dot in. So whatever input comes in, it will be stored in scan. Now after this, I will give or initialize name and marks over here. So I'll just give in a blank for name and I'll initialize the marks value to be equal to zero. 
and I'll have a new method over here. So in the last example, we had only the show details method. But now in addition to the show details method, we are also adding the get details method. So inside the get details method, I am taking the input from the user. So I'm taking the name from the user and also the marks code by the user. So I'll print in enter your name and with the help of this scan object, which I had created over here. So this object would have the next line method. So I'm invoking this next line method and whatever the user gives in that will be stored in the name object. Now, similarly from the scan object. So if you have to store a string, then you'll use next line. On the other hand, if you'd have to read a uh, read a input value from the user, then you'll use next int. So you'll type in scan dot next int and whatever marks or whatever numeric value the user gives in that will be stored in the marks object. So this way you are reading the name of the student and the marks of the student from the external source over here and you're storing it in name and marks. And after that, this is pretty much the same. You'll just show out the details. So let's go ahead and so we've got the student class over here and let me remove all of this. So our task would be to get the input from the user. So for that, we need the scanner class. So I'd have to import it. So input, I'll type in system dot. So this has to be util. So it seems like we have an error over here. So this actually has to be Java dot util dot scanner. So we have successfully imported the scanner class. Now, whatever in inbuilt classes are there. So there are a lot of inbuilt classes provided by Java. So if you have to work with them, then you would have to import those classes without importing those classes. You can't really work with them. So now that you have import the class, you have to create an instance of this. So let me go ahead and create an instance. So we have an extra breeze over here. Let me also remove that extra breeze. Right. So I will type in scanner as so scanner scan, which would be the name of this instance is equal to new scanner. And since I'm taking an input, I'll just type in system dot in. So I have created this instance. Now let me go ahead and initialize my two variables. So this will be string name and I am just instantiating with a blank string and I also have marks and I'll instantiate marks with a zero. So we've got the name ready. We've also got the mark set over here. So now that this is done, I would have to go ahead and read the values and to read the values. I would add the get details method. So I'll type in public void and I'll name the function as get details, get underscore details. And this doesn't really take in anything. All it does is reads the values. So I'll to feed in his name. So system dot out dot print ln enter your name. So this way I'm asking the user to enter his name and whatever value the user gives in so that I will be able to read with the help of scan dot next line. So with the help of scan dot next line, as I've told you, we will be able to read a string input and I will store this in, let's say name. So I have successfully read the name of the student. Now, similarly, I would have to read the mark scored by the student. So let me put in system dot out dot print ln enter your marks. Now I will store this in marks over here which was the same variable which I had created earlier. So this would become scan dot next int. So I have read the name and I've also read the marks. This is set. So now it's time to go ahead and invoke the get details method from over here. So we've got show details already set. I would also have to add the get details. So I'll type in obj dot get details. Now let me also add the show details method over here. So this will be public void. I'll add show details and all I have to do is print in the values over here. 
So this would become system dot out dot print Allen. Name of the student is name. And then I'd have to print out the mark scored by the student, which would be. So I'll add marks of the student R and I'll add in student over here. So this way I am able to read. So this is actually marks over here, not student. So let me change this to marks. So this time I'm able to read the details from the user and also show it out. So we've got both of these set. I'll execute this now. Right now inside the main function first we are invoking the get details method with the help of the student object over here. So now let me feed in the name of the student. So name of the student as Matt. Now I will also add the mark scored by the student. So let's say Mark is very good at studies and he has scored 97 marks. Now after this, since I've also invoked the show details method, I am able to put out the result. So what I see is name of the student is Matt and the marks of the student are 97. So this way we can take an now let's understand what exactly is a constructor and how can we work with a constructor. Now many a times whenever we are creating objects or whenever we are instantiating values to our variables, it would be very easy for us to initialize the values directly at the time of creating the object itself. So I'll repeat it. Now let's say whenever we are working with a lot of values and there are a lot of objects, it would be easier for us to instantiate these values or initialize these values when we are creating the object itself. Now for this purpose, we have a special function named as constructor. So the difference between a normal method and the constructor is that a constructor would have the same name as that of a class. So over here, this is a special function. And the name of this function is student. And as you see, the name of the function is the same as that of class. Now all this constructor does is initialize the variables of this class over here. So we've got two variables S name S marks. Now with the help of this constructor, I am able to initialize this. So as you see, we've got string name int marks and I am initializing these two values during the creation of the object itself. Rest is pretty much the same. So after invoking this, I'll just go ahead and repeat. So this is the difference between a normal method and a constructor over here. So let me just go ahead and create the constructor. So instead of get details over here, I'll remove this get details. So instead of get details, I'd have to add a constructor. So I'll type in public void. Now you also have to remember that a constructor will not have a return type. So no need of void over there public and then the name of the function is student. And I'll add braces over here. So we've got these two initialized. Now let me remove this because I don't really need scanner over here. Right. So I would have int name. So this is actually string name over here string name and I have int marks. So these are local to this particular method over here and I'm setting name is equal to name and marks are equal to marks. Now this seems confusing to you. Let me explain this. So here this name and marks are the name and marks of this class. That is these are local variables of this class. And this name and marks are local to this particular method over here. So to remove the ambiguity, I'll change this as N and I'll change this as M. So let me just put N, N over here and let me change this to be M over here. So I've successfully stored whatever name is passed into this in this and whatever marks are stored into this. So this is how we'll get the details. Now, Let's go ahead and make the changes in the main class over here. So we've got the constructor set. We've also got this detail set. But how are we actually going to pass in values inside the student object? Now, till now, 
we had not used the methods with any parameters so we had not passed any parameters inside these methods this is the first time that we are actually passing in these parameters and initializing our values so how do we pass in this values or from where do we get in these values so now instead of scanning the values in the student class we'll take the input from the main class over here so that is why this would become import java dot util dot scanner so now that i have this i would have to create an object of this so i'll type in scanner obj is equal to new scanner and inside this i'll add in system dot n so i have got this now i'd have to go ahead and uh, read in the details so before that let me just add in system dot out dot print ln because i have to tell the user to input his name so i'll type in enter your name now when the user enters his name i'd have to read it so this is when i'll use the scanner over here so let me actually change this to scan that will be easier to understand so i'll add scan dot next line and whatever result i get i will store it in let's say string my name so i've created a new string and whatever name the user passes in i'll store it over here now similarly i'll ask the user to enter his marks system dot out dot print ln and i'll ask him to enter his marks over here so i'll just type in enter your marks and this time i would need an integer variable so i'll name this variable as my marks and i have to give in scan dot next int so i've also read the marks of the student and i've stored it in int of my marks now it's time to instantiate our student object so student and i'll name this object as obj so student obj would become new student now let me put in a colon over here you so you see there is an error let's understand what is that add arguments to match student right change constructor this now this is because we need to we have actually created a constructor inside the student class which takes in two parameters so that is why we'd have to pass in those two values inside this so the first is the name of the student so i'll pass in my name and similarly i'd have to pass in the marks scored by the student so i'll pass in my marks right now you see that the error has gone so we have passed in the name of the student and the marks of the student and we'll just show the details now let me print this out right so let me add in the name over here let's say the name of the student is julia and julia has scored 83 marks and we are printing out the result name of the student is julia marks of the student are 83 so this is how we can instantiate our variables during the time of execution during run time with the help of a constructor right as you see we have created this constructor and we are passing these values to now let's go ahead and understand the concept of inheritance in java now let's understand the concept of inheritance in real world first so let's say you have your father and you have your grandfather i mean obviously you would have your father and your grandfather now what happens is you will be inheriting some features from your parents and also your grandparents now this is a very simple example of inheritance that could either be let's say hereditary features now it's let's say you look like your father or maybe you look like your grandfather right so these are some of the facial features which you will be inheriting from your parents and if not the facial features it may be monetary right so you might be inheriting some monetary benefits from your parents this is known as inheritance so basically you are deriving some properties from your parents or basically some set of features would be common or if not common there'll be similar between you and your parents i will take the same analogy and will apply it to java so inheritance in java what happens is one class derives the properties of another class so this means that 
some properties would be same in two classes this helps us in reducing code redundancy now there could be a lot of cases where we'd have to write the same code again and again so to avoid that what we'll do is we'll have one class where all of the common code is there and the other classes can inherit this parent class so now that we know the concept of it let's go ahead and work with an example so over here we have a class with the name vehicle and these are the attributes and this is the behavior so inside the attributes the vehicle has cost and the vehicle has mileage so this vehicle costs 234 dollars and the mileage provided by it is 35 uh, let's say 35 gallons per liter and these are the uh, this is basically the method where we are printing out am vehicle and then we are showing the cost of the vehicle and the mileage of the vehicle so this is pretty simple till over here we've just created the parent class now we'll create another class which extends from the vehicle class so we'll add public class car so car is basically another class we can call this the child class of the vehicle class because this is inheriting the properties of the vehicle class so we're just typing out public class car extends vehicle and apart from the properties which the vehicle class has this will have its own properties over here so this has color and this has tires so i'm setting the color of this car to be equal to blue and i'm setting the number of tires for this car to be equal to four and inside i'll inside this class i'll add a new method called as car details and i'll print out all of these details over here so i'm printing out i am a car color of the car is color which is basically blue and then i'm printing out the number of tires in the car which is stored in this object which is four now you might be thinking that we'll be only able to have access to these attributes and this method with the object of this class but you're actually wrong now if we create an instance of the car class we'd be able to work with the attributes and the method of the parent class as well so this extends keyword over here right this helps us to have access to the methods and the attributes of the vehicle class if we extend it publicly so this is a public class and this is also a public class and when this car class extends this vehicle class this would inherit all of these properties of the vehicle class so let me go to eclipse and let me show you so this is our main class over here let me go ahead and delete the previous class we don't really need to work class now now I will go ahead and create a new class. I'll click on new class and let me name the class as vehicle. So again, since this is, our, this is not a main class, this will not constitute the public static void main argument. So I have created this new class over here. Let me add in all of the features inside this. So the vehicle would have cost associated with it. So I'll add cost and let's say the cost of the vehicle is $350. And also this would have uh, a mileage associated with it. So I'll add int mileage as equal to, let's say this would provide me 40, uh, 40 kilometers per gallon. And after this, I'd have to just show out the result. So I'll add a public method over here, public void show. The name of the method would be show vehicle details. And this would not take any parameters. I would just print in some result over here. So this would be system dot out dot. Let me add in print ln, and this would uh, basically print out I am a vehicle. And after printing this out, I'd have to print out the cost of the vehicle and also the mileage of the vehicle. So system dot out dot print ln. I'll add the cost of the vehicle is. I'll add in cost over here. Similarly, I'd have to add the mileage of the vehicle. So this would be. Let me change this over here. Let me just add in mileage. The mileage of the vehicle is. I'll just change this to be equal to mileage so we've got the cost 
and we've also got the mileage so both of these are set over here now it's time to create our child class so again i'll right click on this new i'll create a new class and i will name this class as car i'll click on finish now this is our child class and this child class would extend from our parent class which is vehicle so i'll add public class car extends vehicle now that this is done i'd have to add its own attributes and its own method over here so it would have a color associated with it so string color is equal to this is a blue colored car and it would have the tires attribute with it so i'll add int tires is equal to 4 that would mean this car has four tires and i'll just add a new method this doesn't return anything so this would be public void and i'll name the method as show car details and this would not have any parameters this will just print in some details over here i'll add system dot out dot let me add and print alan over here and i'll just be printing out i am a car and after this i'd have to type in system dot out dot print alan i'd have to show the details of the color and the number of tires i'll add the color of the car is stored in the color variable and then i'd also have to show the number of tires let me change this over here so the number of tires are let me just add in the tires variable over here so i have created the parent class which is the vehicle class and i've also created the child class which is the car class now i'll go to my main class over here and i'll create an instance of my child class so let me add car the name of the instance is obj so car obj is equal to new car now all i have to do is invoke the methods so i'll type in obj dot show so as you see since this car class has inherited from the vehicle class we have access to both the car details method as well as the vehicle details method so first i'll just show you the car details method let me run this now as you see since our uh, car details method is actually a part of the car class we are able to print out all of this so this just shows i am a car the color of the car is blue and the number of tires are 4 now i'll comment this out and instead of this i'll show you obj dot show vehicle details now let me run now even though this vehicle details class is not explicitly stored in the car details class we are able to invoke it because we are extending the vehicle class with the car class so that is why we've got the result i'm a vehicle the cost of the vehicle is 350 and the mileage of the vehicle is 40 So this is the basic concept of Now let's see how can we use constructors in inheritance so we'll be working with the same vehicle class over here and we've got these two attributes cost and mileage now instead of uh, having the details with get details or hard coding them we are having a constructor over here so constructor obviously has the same name as of the class so we've got vehicle over here and we've got vehicle over here and we will initialize the values with the help of this constructor so these values c and m so c goes into cost m goes into mileage and this way we'll be able to initialize cost and mileage and this is the same over here this is the sh uh, same show vehicle details now we have the child class which extends the parent class and it has its own attributes over here which are color and tires now since this extends from the vehicle class this from this car constructor would have to pass in the values into the vehicle constructor now this public car over here this would take in four parameters this would have four parameters because this extends the vehicle class so let me just clarify this vehicle class has two variables and this car class has two variables 
but since also extends the vehicle class this would have four parameters in total so the first parameter inside this car class would be the cost of the vehicle second would be the mileage of the vehicle third would be the color of the class and then fourth would be the number of tires of this car now the first two parameters which we get will pass it into the super method over here so this super method helps us to transfer or pass in these values to the parent class so whenever we have to pass in values from the child class to the parent class we'll use this super method so this way we are able to pass in the cost as well as the mileage of the vehicle through this super method now since these two are set we would also have to initialize the color attribute and the tires attribute so we'll pass in these two so i am passing in the value of call into color and similarly this value which is stored in ty will go into tires now since all of this is set we can go ahead and show the details of the car as well so this is how we can work with inheritance with an instruct so let's do all of this as well so over here let me go to the vehicle class which is our primary class over here now i'd have to instead of hard coding this i'll set the value of cost to be equal to 0 initially and i'll also set the cost of the mileage to be equal to 0 initially we already have the show details method now let me go ahead and create a constructor over here so i'll add public because there is a public constructor this will not return anything and this will have the same name as that of the class so public vehicle and this takes in two parameters so the first parameter as int c and the second parameter is int m now i'll have cost is equal to c so whatever value is in c that will get stored into cost and whatever value is in m that will get stored into mileage so we have got our uh, constructor ready in the vehicle class similarly we'd have to create a constructor in the car class now as you see we have this error over here because we have to add the constructor since this car class extends the vehicle class it is necessary that you would have to have a constructor inside the car class as well so when you what eclipse does is it gives you all of these prompts and with the help of that prompt you can automatically create this super method and this car class over here right now we have created this constructor car and this has these two parameters now apart from these two parameters i'd have to add or assign values to color and tires as well because these are uh, these are variables which are only unique to the car class over here so let me pass in these values as well so i would have string and call then i would also need to take in the number of tires now once that this is done i'd have to store the value of color and i would also have to store the value of tires so let me keep it to be ty over here and i'll add in tires and i'll store the value of ty inside this so i've got this set so we've got errors over here because we've got it two times i have deleted that so we have a constructor inside our parent class and we have a constructor in our child class and with the help of the super method i am able to pass in the values of the parent class through the child class and we've got the rest of the things to be set over here now i'll have to just get in all of those values so over here i would have to uh, need the scanner class again let me just delete all of this over here so i'll type in scanner scan is equal to new scanner and since this reads the input so i would need the system dot in inside as the parameter now after this is done i'd have to get some values so i would need the cost of the vehicle and the mileage of the vehicle first so i'll type scan dot this would be next now before this let me just add a line over here so system dot out dot print ln and i'll ask the user to of the vehicle so i'll add enter cost of vehicle 
so this will be stored in let's say vehicle cost and this is integer so we've got this ready over here scan dot this has to be next end not has next end we've got this set we've still got an error so this has to be small int i believe let me change this properly over here eight quick fixes let me actually see what is the error this is next int now this is set so this has to be small so you'd have to take care of the nomenclature properly over here so in next int n is small and i is capital now similarly i'd have to get the mileage of the vehicle so over here this would be enter mileage of vehicle and i'll change this as vehicle mileage so we've got the cost of the vehicle we've also got the mileage of the vehicle now i'd have to get the color of the vehicle so this would be color of this is actually color of the car so i'll change this to enter color of car and this is actually string so i'll type in string and i'll change this to car color and this would be next line over here so we've also read the color of the car now it's time to get the what else is left so we've got the number of tires present in the car so i'll change this to enter number of tires in car i'll delete all of this and i'll change this to car tires right so the reading of all of the values is done now it's time to invoke the constructor so to invoke the constructor i'd have to uh, create an object out of it so this will be car obj is equal to new car and since this takes in four parameters so again as you see we've got an error over here because this would take in four parameters let me add in all of those four parameters so we've got cost mileage color and number of tires over here so the first would be vehicle cost next would be vehicle mileage after this we've got car color and then we've got car tires so we've passed in everything now it's time to just print out the values over here so this would be obj dot show car details and obj dot show vehicle details i'll just hit enter and let's see what do we have over here right so enter cost of vehicle i'll set the cost of vehicle to be 600 mileage of vehicle is let's say 70 kilometers per gallon and then we've got enter color of car so um, why do we have an error over here so color of car let me set it to be blue over here so we've got an error let's check what exactly is the error over here so enter color of car scan dot next line which would be stored over there and then we've got enter number of tires in car which we are so basically this has to be next and not next line that is what was causing the error go ahead and click on run so i'll set the cost of the vehicle so let's say the cost of the vehicle is 700 dollars i'll set the mileage of the vehicle so let's say the car gives around 50 kilometers per gallon and the color of the car is blue and i'll also set the number of tires in the car so this car has got four tires in the car. Now through the help of the constructor, I'd added all the details. And since we are invoking show car details, this is what we have first. I'm a car. The color of the car is blue and the number of tires are four. After that, we're also invo invoking the show vehicle details method, which gives us I'm a vehicle. The cost of vehicle is 700. And now let's understand a special type of inheritance in Java, which is known as multi-level inheritance. So in multi-level inheritance, as you can see over here, we have the parent-child-grandchild relationship. So let's say we start off at the top over here, parent. Then some of the features of the parent would be inherited by the child. Now let's say the child has a grandchild. 
then some features of child would be inherited by grandchild. So what is happening is there is a flow of features from the top to the bottom. Now, since the child has features of parent and since grandchild is inheriting features of child, this would mean that grandchild would also have features of parent. So this hierarchy which you see over here, this is known as multi-level inheritance. Now, we'll implement multi-level inheritance in Java. Now we'll see how to implement the concept of multi-level inheritance in Java. So we'll start off with the parent class over here. So the syntax is pretty much the same public class parent and this would have the attribute name. So string name and initially we'll keep it as blank. Now we'll have a constructor over here public parent and we'll assign the value of name through this constructor. After that is done, all we're doing is showing out the name of parent over here. So this is simple till now. All we have done is created the base class, which is parent. Now we'll create a child class over here, class child. And this child class extends from the parent class. And this will have its own attribute, which is age. And I'm initializing the value of age to be equal to zero. And since parent class has a constructor, that is why you definitely need to have a constructor in your child class as well. Now you'd have to pass in two parameters inside this constructor. First would be for the name of the parent. Second would be for the age of this child class. So string n, which will pass to the super method and the super method will help us in passing this value to the name of the parent class. And since we've got the age over here, we'll pass in this a into the age over here. Now that we've set the age of this child as well, we'll just go ahead and show the age of this child. And after this, this is where the third step comes in. So now we have the grandchild class, which extends from the child class. And this has its own attribute, which is the gender. And since the child class has a constructor and the parent class has a constructor, you definitely need to have a constructor for your grandchild class as well. And this takes in three parameters. First parameter is for the name of the parent. Second parameter is for the age of the child and third parameter is for the gender of your grandchild. So the first two parameters will pass in through the super method over here and the third value will assign it to gender. Now all of that is done. We'll go ahead and just show the gender of grandchild. So we'll put out gender as gender. So we'll go to Eclipse and let's work with all of this. So my first task would be to create the parent class. So I've got this package over here. I'll right click on this, select new and inside this, I'll select class. So I'd have to create the parent class over here and this will not have public static void main. So I've got my parent class. I have to go ahead and create a new variable. So this would be name and with the help of this, I'd be able to assign a name to the person. Now I'd have to create a constructor for this. So I'll type in public and then I'll type in parent. This obviously doesn't have a return type. Now this constructor will take in a value. So that value would be a string. So string s and all I have to do is name is equal to s. So this is how I am assigning a value to the name of this. So now that this is done, I just have to show the name of this person. So this would be public void. I'll give the name of the method as show name. And this will not have a parameter. All this does is prints out the name of the person. So system dot out dot print ln and inside this I'll type in the name is and I'll add the variable name over here. So this is how I print out the name of the person. Now that this is done, I'd have to create the child class. So I'll right click on the package over here new and I need a new class and I'll give the name of the class to be equal to child. And this child class would extend from the parent class. So public class child extends parent and we have this error over here. So let's see what exactly is to be done. Implicit super constructor parent is undefined for default constructor must define an explicit constructor over here. Let's see what can be done over here. So seems like we have to create an explicit constructor. 
if I click on this, we have the option add constructor child string, right? So we have set this over here. Now we have to make modifications into this constructor. Now before this, as we've seen in the presentation, this child class will also have another attribute, which is age. So I'll set or initialize this age value to be equal to zero. And this will take in two things. First is the name and then this will also have age. And in super, we are passing in S, which will directly go to the parent class. Now after this, I'll have to assign the age value. So I'm passing in A into H. So we've got the constructor ready for the child class. Now it's time to create a method to show the age. So I'll add public void and the name of the method would be show age. And I just have to print out the age so system dot out dot print ln and inside this I'll type in the age is I'll give in the variable which is age so I've got the parent class ready I've also got the child class ready now it's time to go ahead and create the grandchild class so I'll have a new class over here and I will name this class as grandchild I'll click on finish and we'll have our class ready over here now this grandchild class would extend from our child class. So I'll add child over here. Let me click on this and we'll have a constructor ready. Add constructor grandchild, right? So this has automatically created the constructor for us. Now this would already have a attribute which is actually gender. So I'll have string and then gender and initially I'll just assign it to a blank string. And this constructor over here would take in three parameters, name, age, and then we would also need another string variable G. So we've passed in these two into the super constructor. So S, which is the name, would go to the parent class. A, which is age, will go to the child class. Now, for the grandchild class, I am assigning the value of G into gender. This is set. All I have to do is create my show method. So public void and this time I'd have to show the gender. So this would be public void show gender. And inside this, I'll just print out the value of the gender. So I'll type in system dot out dot print ln. And inside this, I'd have to write the gender of the, or let me just keep it simple, the gender is, and I'll have the variable ready over here, the gender is gender. So all of this is set. So we've got our three classes ready. We've also implemented the code for multi-level inheritance. All I have to do is go to the main class over here and I would have to create an object for the grandchild class. So this is the grandchild class. I'd have to create an object. I'll name the object as OBJ. And this is my new object, which is ready. So seems like we have an error. Let's see what the error is. Right now we have all of these instructors over here. So that is why we'd have to pass in values. So let's say the first is the name. Let's say the name of the person is Annie. And then we've got age. Let's say Annie is 25 years old. And then we've got gender. So Annie is female. So we've got all of this ready over here. Invalid character constant. So let me keep it in double quotes over here. So if it's a string, you would have to keep it in double quotes. So this is something you would have to remember in Java. So again, since this is a string, you'd have to keep it in double quotes over here. So you've got this set. So again, seems like we have an error. This is not really required over here. Let me select this over here. Let's see what happens. We again, don't really need this. Let me just go ahead and remove this over here. Right. So we've got all of this set public grandchild this is public as well and this is public as well all of this is set over here now i'd have to 
use this method so obj dot i'd have to show the age and similarly i'd have to show the gender and i'd also have to show the name of it so i'll add name now let me click on run and let's have a glance at the result so it seems like we've got some error let's see what that error is now whenever we are creating an object it is necessary that we use the new keyword over here so that was the error now i'll click on run so as we see we have the result the age is 25 the gender is female and the name is annie now this is again hard coding now let's take input from the user over here so if we have to take input from the user then we would need the scanner object so i'll type in scanner i'll create an object of this this will again become new scanner and since we are taking input we'll have to pass in the parameter system dot in now i would add a print statement for all three of these so i'll type in system dot out dot print ln so starting off, I would need the age of the person. So I would actually need the name of the person first. So I'll type in enter name and this I'll store in scan dot next. So I am, this has to be small n over here and this I am storing in, let's say my name. So I'll add string my name so in my name i'm storing the name of who this person is similarly i would need the age of the person so i'll type in enter age and over here i would need int and in this i'll have my age is equal to scan dot i'll have next int this is also set over here and then finally i'd have to take the gender of the person so system dot out dot print ln i'll have enter gender and this again will be a string so string my gender and i am storing the gender inside this this would become scan dot next so i've got all three of this set over here now I'd have to, now that I've read all of these values, I'd have to pass in those values inside this constructor over here. So first I'd have to pass in the name that just stored in my name. Then I'd have to pass in the age, which is stored in my age. And then I'd have to pass in the gender, which is stored in my gender. So all of this is done. I'll click on this. So we have executed this. I'd have to start off by giving the name of the person. So let's say the name of the person is Jennifer and Jennifer is 18 years old and she is obviously female and we've got the result. The age is 18, the gender is female and the name is Jennifer. So this is how we can work with multi-level inheritance. Now let's understand the concept of abstract class. So till now we've worked with general classes and we've seen how to implement the concept of inheritance with these general classes. So there's a specific type of class in Java which is known as an abstract class. So let's understand what is that. Now many a times it happens that we would want to show only some specific parts to the user and hide out all of the important uh, parts. Now because we wouldn't want the secrets for the user to know. Now, in that cases where we want only some of the parts of the code to be known, that is where we require some sort of abstraction. So the concept of abstraction in simple terms is you show only the parts which are required and whatever parts are supposed to be hidden, you keep them to be hidden. So that is the concept of abstraction. And that has given rise to something known as an abstract class. So. When you work with this abstract class, you can't create objects of this abstract class. So that is one important point of this. And this is how this abstract class looks like. So this over here is same class and then you give the name of the class. But before the class, you'd have to add the prefix abstract. And when you add the prefix abstract, this makes this class abstract and inside this, you can go ahead and add either normal methods or abstract methods. So if it's an abstract method, then again, it's the same over here. It says that you'd have to add the keyword abstract. Now, if there are abstract methods inside your abstract class, 
then these methods have to be overridden in whichever class inherits this abstract class. Now, the point to note over here is since you can't create an object of this abstract class, this, if you want to work with this class, this has to be inherited by some other class. Only then you can inherit the features of these or you can work with this class. So this is the basic idea behind this. Now what we are doing over here is we are creating another class called as cat which extends this abstract class animal. Now as you see over here we've got this abstract method animal sound and we override that method inside the cat class. Now what is overriding? So in simple terms in inheritance if we inherit a method from the base class then if we change whatever is written inside the base method then that is known as method overriding. So over here we have taken or inherited this animal sound method and we are overriding this method. Now similarly what we've done over here is there is another class known as dog which extends this animal abstract class. Now over here you see that the animal sound made by a cat is meow and over here you see that the animal sound made by a dog is pow pow. So this is the basic difference. So your abstract class over there gives you sort of a template which can be used by multiple classes. So let's go ahead and implement this in Eclipse. So my first task would be to create the abstract class. So I'll go to this test project, I'll right click this, new and this has to be a class. Now over here, you would have to check the abstract box over here and I'll give the name of this class. This would be animal. So I have successfully created this abstract class with the name animal. Now inside this, I would need the abstract method. So since this is a public method, I'll add public and this is an abstract method. So I'll add abstract. So public abstract void. And the name of the method is animal sound. And this doesn't take anything. This doesn't also require a body. All you do is put in a semicolon over here. Now important thing to keep in mind over here is an abstract method does not have a body. So the body for an abstract method is given inside the class which inherits this particular class. So we've got our abstract class. Now it's time to create two more classes. So the first class we'll name it as cat. So this will be a public class. Now this class extends the animal class. So public class cat extends animal. So as you see over here, we have to add the unimplemented methods. Now whenever you have or whenever you extend an abstract class, it becomes a necessity that you implement these methods over there. So basically what you do is you type in public and then you add abstract. Now after this you add void and then you type animal sound and then you give in the body of it inside this. Now since you are actually extending it you don't have to give in the abstract keyword over here. So this is important guys. So the abstract keyword, it comes in only the abstract class, whichever class inherits this abstract class inside that this doesn't have to be there, right? So we have done this. Now I'd have to override this. So I'll just type in system.out.println and I'll give in the animal sound over here. So cat makes the sound meow. So we've got this ready. Now let's see what is the error over here, add unimplemented method. So it's the same thing over here. I'll just delete, we do not require this. So everything is set. Public void animal sound. So this was the error over here. So we had to keep it capital S over there and there was no underscore over here. So the name of the method was animal sound. Right now, similarly, we'll go ahead and create another class. So I'll have new and then I'll select class over here. Now this, I'm naming this class as dog. I'll click on finish over here. Right, again, this would be extending. It is extends. 
animal now since this extends animal which is an abstract class we'd have to give the definition inside this so it would be let me write it properly over here public void animal sound and let me give in the body over here system dot out dot print ln and i'll give in the sound made by a dog inside this so this is also set so we've got both of this ready over here let me see if we have made some error again animal sound this is set abstract class animal let me go over here we have added the unimplemented methods over here so but still this has to be a capital right so guys make sure that you're giving the taking care of the proper caps lock or small case over here so all of this is set these two classes have uh, inherited from the abstract class now it's time to create an object of those two classes so what we'll do over here is i will start with the cat class create an object of it name the object as c so this will be cat c is equal to new cat and with the help of this i will invoke animal sound now similarly i will create uh, instance of dog so this will become dog d is equal to new dog and again i'll have d dot animal sound now let's just run the entire code and let's see what do we get right so first we are printing out the animal sound of a cat which is meow and then we are printing out the animal sound of a dog which is pow pow so this is how we can work with an abstract class now after abstract class we have a similar concept which helps us with abstraction which is known as an interface as it is stated over here an interface is a completely abstract class so when it comes to an abstract class a simple abstract class you can have abstract methods or normal methods but when it comes to an interface you can only have abstract methods you cannot have normal methods inside it so all of the methods whatever methods you have in an interface all of them have to be overridden by whatever class implements this interface so this is the basic idea behind an interface over here so instead of writing class you have the keyword interface so you put in public interface phone and inside it you add in all of the methods which have to be overridden by the class now you can consider an interface to be a basic template which can be used by multiple classes so this becomes a basic template over here now once we have a basic template ready i will go ahead and have a new class which can implement this so over here the name of the class is iphone which implements phone and i am overriding those three methods so as you see over here i am overriding the cost method the color method and the battery life method and i am just printing out all of these three things so let's go ahead and work with an interface in java I'll have to delete all of this. Let me delete these three animal classes over there and let me also remove out the stuff. Now it's time to create a new interface actually. So new interface and I will name this interface as phone. I'll click on finish. Now as I've told you an interface can only comprise of abstract methods. So over here a phone, what does a phone have? So a phone would have cost so this would be public void i'll add cost a phone would have color so i'll add public let me make it color public void color and then a phone would also have a battery life associated with it so i'll add public void let me type in battery life over here so i've got all these three things set so now that i've got my interface it's time to implement this interface so here I'll create a new class and then I'll name this new class as iPhone and this iPhone is basically implementing the phone interface. Now it's important that you understand the difference between what is happening in the interface, in the inheritance and in the implementing over here. So when you're inheriting a class, you add the keyword extends and when you're implementing an interface you add implements over here so this is the difference which you would have to understand public class iphone 
implements phone. So now that you have this, you would have to override all of the methods. So the first method over there was public void cost. And then we had the second method, which was public void color. Again, you'd have to have the body over here. So you'll have it this way. And you also have color. And after color, you would have battery life. So let me put in battery life over here. So I got all of these three methods set. So I have overridden. Now I have to add the body inside this. So let me use, let me just type in system dot out dot print ln and inside this I'll add cost of iPhone as $600. Inside this I'll type, let me write in the print ln properly. So this becomes color of iPhone as let's say blue and then we've finally got the battery life over here so system dot out dot print ln and then let's say the battery life of iPhone is 15 hours so we've got this iPhone which is implementing phone now it's time to create an instance of iPhone. So I'll go to the main class over here and inside this, let me have my iPhone class and I'll create an object of it. I'll name it as IP. Here I'll type in new iPhone. I've got this set. Now with the help of this, I can invoke all of the three methods. So here I'll put IP.batterylife. Then I've got IP.color. After that, I've got IP.cost. So I've got all three of these things set over here. Now let me hit run and let's see what is the result over here, right? So this is how we can work with interfaces. So the result is battery life of iPhone is 15 hours, color of iPhone is blue, and then the cost of iPhone is $600. Now we'll see how can one class inherit as well as implement. So here we'll start with this class named as person class. So person class, this has two attributes, which is the name of the person and then the age of the person. So initially we'll set the name to be blank, the age to be equal to zero, and then we'll add a constructor over here. So this constructor basically assigns the value to the name and the age of this person. Now that this is done, we'll go ahead and print out the details of the person. So the name of the person is this and the age of the person is this. So we've got the person class ready. After this, we'll go ahead and create an interface with the name father. So public interface father, and then this will have one abstract method, which is task. So we've got a class ready. We've got the interface also ready. Now it's time to create our class known as man, which would extend the class and also implement the interface over here. Now this you have to understand because we are inheriting, we're doing two things over here. So the first thing is we are inheriting a class and the second thing is we are implementing a method. Now, normally if you want to extend two classes in Java, that is not possible because Java does not allow multiple inheritance. Guys, I'm repeating it. Java does not allow multiple inheritance. So to overcome this, what Java provides you is something known as interface. So when you want to do something which is similar to multiple inheritance, instead you can extend one class and implement an interface. So this is something you can do in Java. So over here, this man class extends the person class and implements the father interface. Now that this is done, we have another attribute inside this man class called as salary and I'm setting it to be equal to zero. And since this extends the person class, which has a constructor inside it, I have a constructor over here with the name man and the first two attributes over here go into the super method. So N over here would go into the name of the person. A over here would go into the age of the person. Now that these two are set, I would also have to set the salary of the person. So for that, I have int S and I'm assigning S to this variable salary. So I've got all of this to be set. 
And since this is also implementing the father interface, we'd have to override the method which is present in this father interface, which is task. So a task of a father is to earn money. So all of these things are happening in this man class. Let's go ahead and work with this. Now again, let me delete these two from over here. This is done. I'd have to create my first class. So new class and the name of the class is person. So this is a public class, obviously. And inside this, we've got a lot of things going on. So first we'd have to set the name of the person. So string name and initially I'll set it to be a blank. And after this, I'd also have to set the age of the person. So I'll set the age to be equal to zero. Now that this is done, I will use a constructor because I'd have to initialize the values of name and age. So I'll have public person over here and I'll have, let me add in some parameters inside this. So I'll have a string parameter S and I'll have an int parameter A. So I am assigning the value of S into name and I would also assign the value of A into age. So our constructor is also ready. Now it's time to show the details. So public void show person details. And this does not take in any parameters. All it does is show the details. So let me print out. So the first detail would be the name of the person. So I'll type in the name of the person is, I'll have the variable name over here. And then after this, I'd have to print out the age of the person. So I'll print out system dot out dot. This would be print Ellen. And here I'll add the age of the person is, I'll just have age over here. So I've got this entire class ready. Now it's time to create my interface. So I'll click on new and I'll select on interface. Now I will name this interface as father. So I've got my father interface ready and inside this I'd have to create an abstract method. So this would be public void task and all I do inside this method would be well, we actually don't have to do anything inside this since this is an interface. I just have to create an object like this. Now we will go ahead and have another class, new class, and I'll name this class as man. Now this man class would extend the person's class. So extends person and this would also implement an interface. So implements father. So we've got both of this set over here. Now we need a constructor over here, right? So I'll add public man and inside this, we would need the super method over here. So this takes in three parameters actually. Now we would also have the salary of the man. So let me just set int salary is equal to zero initially. Now this man constructor would take in three parameters. So the first would be the name of the person, which would be string s. Next would be the age of the person, which would be int a. And then next would be the salary of the person. Let me just put it to be s, so it should be int s. Now out of this, I'll just pass in s and a inside the super method. So this is also ready. Now let me actually change this to let's say SA so that we have a clear distinction between both of them. Right. So now that we've got both of these set, it's time to also assign the salary over here. So inside salary, I am adding SA. If you guys have confusion, I'll just repeat it. Since this person class is extending the man class and there's a constructor inside, Sorry, it's actually the opposite since the man class is extending the person class and there's an uh, 
constructor present inside this person class we'd have to override that constructor and to do that we would need this super method so the first two parameters go into the super method so the name goes over here the age goes over here and the salary which is unique this attribute is unique to this man class so that i'm passing in over here so now that the constructor is set i would also have to override the method which is present in the father interface so this is public void task so let me just add public void task over here and inside this let me just set in the task so here this would be system dot out dot print ln and inside this i'll add in earn money so this is also set and after this i just have to go to the main class over here let me delete all of this and i'd have to create a new instance of man so i'll have man m is equal to new man this is set but then again since this has a constructor i need to add in the values of the name of the person the age of the person and the salary of the person so let me have my scanner class ready over here so i'll type in scanner scan is equal to new scanner and in this i'll put in system dot n so now that this is set i just would have to give in the instructions to the user so he can give me the details so system dot out dot print ln so i'd have to start off by getting the name of the person so i'll type enter name and this i'll take through next and i would have to store this somewhere so this remember has to be small and i'd have to store this so i'll store this in let's say my name so i've taken the name from the user now similarly i'd have to take the age from the user so i'll type in system dot out dot print ln and inside this i'll type enter age now that this is done again i'd have to use scan so this time it will be next int let me put it to be small n over here and the result which this gives out would be stored in let's say my this would become each this is also done and then i would have the final print statement system dot out dot print ln and inside this i would ask for the salary of the person so i'll type enter salary and this would become scan dot next int so this would be scan dot next int and i will store this in int and i'll name the variable as my salary so all of this is set properly now after this i just have to pass in the value so the first value would be the name of the person so i'll pass in my name and then i'd have to pass in the age of the person which would be my age and then i'd also have to pass in the salary of the person which would be my salary again all of this is set now that this is done i'll have i would uh, basically have to print out the details of the person so let me just go ahead and also invoke the tasks over here so i'll type in m dot task and then after this i would also have m dot show person details now i'll click enter and let's see the final result so first i'd have to add in the name of the person so let's say the name of the person is raj raj is 28 years old he's 18 years old sorry and let's say he earns around um, twenty thousand dollars or two hundred thousand dollars seems like he's rich so since he's a man and he's actually a father at the age of 18 so that's interesting and he earns money that is his task which is so this method basically we are invoking it from the interface and the name of the person is raj and the age of the person is 18. now let's go ahead and understand some collections in java the first collection which we'll be working with is array list so simply put array list is a resizable array with many useful methods to work with 
Now, when you have a normal array, a simple array, the problem with the simple array is its size is fixed. So let's say if you have an array with the size of 10, and if you want to change it later on, that is not possible. So that is why instead of using an array, when you use an array list, you can expand it as and when you want to add more elements. So this is one useful advantage of array list. Now, let's go ahead and see how can we create an array list in Java. So this would be the syntax to create array list. So you'll type array list and inside this parenthesis, you will give in the data type. So I want to create an array list where the elements would be of string. And I am naming this array list, the name of this array list as cars. So this over here is basically the initialization of it, new array list. And then I'll go ahead and add the elements. If I want to add elements into an array list, I'd have to use the add method. So I'm going ahead and adding all of these cars or car names into this. And when I print it out, I'll get the result. So let's go ahead and work with an array list. While type array list, and I'd have to give in less than symbol and greater than symbol. And inside this, I'd have to give in the data type which I want to work with. So I'll type in string over here. Now after this, I'd have to give in the name of this array list. So let's say I want to add a bunch of colors in this. So I'll just name this as colors. And I'd have to create a new array list. So let me just type in array list. Again, this would have elements of string type. So I have successfully initialized this array list. But you have an error over here. Now this is because this array list is a part of the java.util package. So I'd have to import it first. So let me just click on it. Now, as you see, we have imported the java.util package over here. So we've got java.util.array list. And now if you see over here, the error has been removed from this. So let me go ahead and add some elements into this. So I'll type in colors.add. Let's say I want to add green color first. After this, I want to add red. So I'll add red over here. Then I'd want to add blue. I'll have blue. Now, similarly, I'll go ahead and I'll add yellow. And then I'll add one final color. So I'll type in colors.add. And let's say the final color is orange. So I'll also add an orange. So these are the different colors which I've added into this array list. Now, if I want to print it out, all I have to do is use the system.out.println function over here. And let me just give in the name of this array list, which would be colors. I'll hit enter and let's see what is the result over here. So as you see, this is our array list, which comprises of all of these elements. We've got green, red, blue, yellow, and orange. Now let's look at some different operations on this array list. So if we want to get some individual elements out of this, let's say if I want to get the element which is present at index zero or maybe index three, then I can use the get method. So as you see over here, cars.get zero, I'll get the element which is present at zero at index. Similarly, when I put in cars.get three, I'll get the element which is present at third index. Now we can also go ahead and change the values which are present in an array list. So over here, I am typing cars.set. So I want to change the value of the element which is present at index zero. So as you see over here, cars.set, I am changing the element which is present at index zero. So whatever that is, I'm changing that to opel. Similarly, if I want to remove an element in a particular index, I can use the remove method. So over here, I am typing cars.remove and whichever index value I give, that element will be removed. Now. Let's see how can I extract some elements out of this. So let's say if I want to extract this element which is presented index zero. So I'd have to type in colors dot get and I'd have to give in the index value which is zero. Now I actually have to put this inside the print statement over here. So let me cut this out. Let me paste this inside the print statement. This semicolon also has to be removed. Now, let me run this and let's see what is the result. So as you see, I have successfully extracted the element which is presented index zero. Similarly, if I want the element which is presented index number three, so one, zero, one, two, and three. 
So let me put in free over here. And I'll hit run. So as you see, I have extracted this. So this is how you can extract individual elements from this array list. Now I can also go ahead and change a value over here. Now let's say I want to change this element which is present at zero from green to purple. So I have to type colors dot set and first I'd have to give in the index number which is zero and from green I will change it to purple. Now let's just print out this over here. Let me actually cut it. Let me paste it over here. Now let's see what is the result. So as you see, initially it was green and with the help of the set method, I'm able to change this to purple. Now we are left with one final method which would help us to remove elements from a certain index. So I'll type in colors dot remove. And let's say I want to remove the element which is present at index zero. So I'll put in zero over here and let me run this now. So let me actually copy it and paste it again over here. Then we'll get the proper result. Now let me run this. Right. So before removing the element at zero at index, we had purple and after removing the element at zero at index, purple has been removed. Right. So as you see, initially we had five elements after removing it, we've got four elements. Now another collection in Java is a linked list. So while an array list uses an array internally, when it comes to a linked list, it would use a doubly linked list internally. So rest everything is pretty much the same when you compare an array list to a linked list. A linked list is normally used for the purpose of searching and sorting and while an array list is used for the purpose of storage and whatever operations you normally do those operations when you compare a linked list to an array list they are faster on a linked list. This is the text to create a linked list. First you type in linked list and then whatever data type of elements you want to store that you'll give in over here inside the less than symbol and the greater than symbol. So I want to store string values, which are basically names. Now inside this, I'll go ahead and add some random names. So these names are Sam, Bob, Matt and Leo. And then I'll go ahead and print out the names. Now once that is done, if I want to, let's say, add an element at the beginning of the linked list, then I have the add first method. So as you see, I'm adding Julia at the beginning of the linked list. Similarly, if I want to add an element at the end of a linked list, I can add Annie like this. So add first, add last, we've already seen. Now let's see remove first and remove last. So let's say if I want to remove an element from the beginning of a linked list, then I can use the remove first method. Similarly, if I want to remove an element from the end of a linked list, then I can use the remove last method. So let's go to Eclipse up again and work with all of these. So I'll just cut this out from here. Now that this is done, let me go ahead and create a linked list. And I would want all of the elements to be of string type. I'll name it as names new. And since I want a linked list, I'll just put in linked list over here. And this is of string type. Now it's time to add in some elements. So as you see, we have got this imported linked list from java.util. Now it's time to go ahead and add some elements into this. So I'll have names.add. And I'll have my first name over here. Let's say I add in Sam. Now let me just copy paste this so it'll be easier for me for the rest of the tasks. So I've got Sam, then I've got Bob, I've got Matt, after Matt, I've got Julia, then I've got Annie, and finally I've got, let's say, Devon. So these are all of the names. Now, if I want to print this out, all I have to do is use system.out.print and in this, I'll give in the name of the linked list, which is names. And this is how I can get the results. So these are all of the names which are present in the linked list. Now let's go ahead and work with those basic operations. So let's say if I want to add 
one element at the beginning of a linked list. So for that, I have to use names dot add and let's say the name which I want to add would be Jennifer. Now let me execute this and let's see what happens. So as you see, this has been added at the end, but if I want to add it at the beginning, I'll use add first. Now, let me run this, right? So Jennifer has been added at the beginning. Now, similarly, if I want to add something at the end, which is basically what is happening in general. So let's say if I want to add Raj over here, I'll have Raj and then I'll print this out. So as you see, I've got, uh, this is actually add last. So let me change this to add last. So I've got Jennifer at the beginning of the linked list and Raj at the end of the linked list. So these are, this is how I can add elements at the first and at the last. Now let's see how can I remove elements from the beginning and at the end. So first I'd have to give in the name of the linked list, which is names. And then I'll use remove first. And let me print this out again. Now, when I use this, let's see what is the result. So initially we had Jennifer at the beginning. Now, what is happening over here? E right. So this is our initial link list where we had Jennifer at the beginning. And after using remove first, we see that Jennifer has been removed. Now, similarly, I'll also use names dot remove last. Now, let me run this and see what is happening. So initially we had Jennifer at the beginning and Raj at the last. So now when we've used both of them, we see that both of them have been removed.